Yes, I do. I do. I think the first thing we should do is uh, have Vincent call the roll, please, Vincent. Sure. Sure we have a quorum. Right. Okay. So um, I'm going to call the roll in alphabetical order. Robin Broshi. Here. Uh, Vincent Hom, I'm here. Uh, Eric Goldberg. Here. Emily Hellstrom. Here. Edward Irizari. I'm here. Maud Marin. Has she been let back in? She's here. Sorry, Vincent, I'm here. I didn't unmute myself when I said Okay. Uh, Benjamin Morden. I'm here. I'm here, Vincent. Okay. Uh, Leonard Silverman. Here. Shino Tanakawa. Here. Tom Rock. Okay, we have. Yeah, um, yeah, I just want to say, um, Ushma, I'm showing 96 participants, but I'm, my list only goes through the first couple. So, in other words, I'm gonna, it's going to take me a while to scroll down and find people, but I'll, I'll do it. But uh, I just want to give a little disclaimer there. Okay, I got it. Uh, it'll take me a little longer than usual. Okay, all set. Thank you. Okay, so all 11 members are present. And 643. Great, thank you very much. Um, I want to thank everyone, all of my fellow council members um, for all of the help that uh, they've provided me during this period of transition. I wanna thank my fellow officers, Ben Morden, the treasurer, as well as Vincent Hom, the recording secretary. Uh, and of course, Yvette Fernandez for doing such a great job as always. Well, I guess uh, let's get right to work here. Um, the first order of business here on the agenda is the officer elections. Um, anyone can nominate themselves or any other council uh, person. Uh, are there any nominations for, pre for the office of president? I'd like to nominate Ed Irizari for president of CECG2. Are there any other nominations for the office of president? I'd like to nominate um, Vincent Hom. Mm -hmm. There's no shirt or thing until uh, yet, right? Okay. <laughs> any other nominations? That is so awesome. Oh, we went to the game like a week later when Kanye um, West. David Wright retired, right? No, no one was that. This is 2006. Okay, so. Right, sorry. Can you mute everyone again? Yeah. I'm going to mute all, and then council members can um, unmute themselves. So, council members, go ahead and unmute yourselves. So, um, so the way this will work is the. Ken, are you here? Is that. Ben Morden. Okay. So Ben, you because the other two people running are officers, uh, you are the next officer in line. So uh, you would be you are uh, running this election. Um, if you don't want to, we can agree on a, a pro tem. To I don't want to. Point of order. Yeah. We need to accept the nomination before you move forward. Okay. Edward, well, need a pro. Okay. Do they accept their nominations? Um, I accept. Ed, you're muted. I'm reading this. Of having a president and having a vice president, I accept. It's a short book. Okay. So we now need to kind of, we need a pro tem to run the election because Ben has uh, declined to take the position. Does someone want to nominate themselves to run the election, which will essentially mean asking each candidate to make a statement, time them for two minutes. I nominate Robin Broshi as pro tem. Okay, we have to vote on that, so. I second that. 
All right. Um, okay. So we need a show of hands if you're comfortable with that. Uh, one, two, three. All right. I'm going to run this election. So we'll uh, HI. So uh, in the spirit of the way we do our annual meetings, um, every candidate is going to have two minutes to speak. So um, Vincent, that's going to be you. And just give me a minute to pull up my uh, my clock. One more thing, Robin. You yep. need to close nominations for president before people speak. Okay, thank you. So are there any more nominations for president? Okay, so I'm gonna close the nominations now. And uh, Vincent, wait, hold on, I set the timer wrong. Okay, uh, go ahead. Thank you, Robin. Um, so I just wanna make a few quick comments. Um, over the last few months, we've seen the council has, I feel, strayed from its core mission. Uh, personalities and some personal agendas from inside our council and from outside have worked to distract us from the work that we were elected and appointed to do in serving the students and families of District 2. Although in our group, uh, there's a, a diversity of viewpoints on some contentious issues. We also share common ground on many other issues. If uh, I'm elected, I would build on this co common ground to encourage increased collaboration uh, amongst our group so that we're working together for the collective benefit of the district. Uh, in this time of uh, great uncertainty, I wanna move us back to the basics of improving education and academic advancement for the students and families of our district uh, who expect us to help them have a voice in education policy. I think it's important to point out that I don't have any ambition with respect to the council beyond June of next year uh, because I won't qualify to be reelected in as either a member or a president. Uh, if elected as the council president, I would strive to advance the business of the council with transparency, neutrality, and humility. So uh, I wanna thank all of you for uh, considering me for the office. Okay, one second. All right. Thank you, Vincent. Um, Ed, are you ready? Yes, thank you, Robin. Okay. This council, this council, as everyone knows, has been divided. There's been a great deal of rancor. We have not focused on issues of education as we should. If there is anything that I can do to mend this division, to achieve consensus among all of the members of the council, then I will do so. As everyone knows here, I believe in academic rigor. I believe in academic achievement, but I also believe in integration and diversity. I don't think those th two things are mutually exclusive. And I think that this is an opportune time to um, work together as council members uh, in a collaborative manner, which is what I think we've been missing in a transparent manner to get all of the information and data that we need to make the right decisions uh, for our children in these schools. So having said that, um, if I can uh, bring about uh, consensus, I uh, do accept the nomination and I asked and I ask for everyone's vote. I have treated everyone with respect, be they appointed or be they elected, whether they received 100 votes or one vote. And I think that's the way it ought to be. So thank you for this opportunity. And I look forward to continuing to serve this council. 
Thank you. All right, so what I'm gonna do is do a roll call vote. I'm gonna go through everyone's name in alphabetical order um, as soon as I pull up my meeting agenda. And you have to say the name of the person you're supporting. Do we have a chance to question the candidate? Nope. And you're gonna say the name of the person in order and excuse me, you're gonna say the name of a person that you support or you can abstain. And oh, our, let's see. So first is Rob Ambrosi, that's me. And I'm gonna vote for uh, Ed Irizarry. Um, next is Eric Goldberg. Uh, Ed Irizarry. Okay, and then uh, Emily. Edward Irizarry. Okay, and then Vincent. Um, I'm gonna vote for myself, Vincent Hom. Yeah. Um, uh, Edward. I'll vote for Ed Irizarry myself. Um, Maud. Maud, are you I vote for Vincent Hom. And Ben? I vote for Vincent Hom. And Bushma? Vincent Hom. And Len? Vincent Hom. And Shino? Edward. And Tom? Edward. Okay. So that means one, two, three, four, five, six. We have a consensus around, we have a majority for Edward Irizarry, um, which means we now have an opening for vice president. As Edward is uh, now the president of the council, uh, he can choose to take over running the rest of the election or I can finish, it's up, excuse me, it's up to you, Ed. Please finish, Robin. Okay. So I would like to open up nominations for vice president of the council. I noticed there was just some questions in the from the participants. This is a only council members can nominate themselves or other council members. So um, the commentary from the public is that you guys can um, is just for watching. So. Um, do I have any nominations for uh, vice president? I nominate Vincent Hom. Okay, Tom nominates Vincent. Uh, Vincent, do you accept the nomination? Um, yes, I do. Okay. Are there any other nominations for uh, vice president? Has our waiting room been opened? because there are, I think, are people trying to get in. Right now, there's nobody in the waiting room. Are there any other nominations for vice president of the council? Okay, so I'm gonna close the nominations for vice president of the council um, because there is no, uh, no one else running. Um, Vincent, you know I, I'm sorry. I would yep. like to run. I would like to run for vice president. I, I okay. didn't know that Vincent was going to run, and I had wanted to run. And I feel like, um, even though I think Vincent, wait, 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 okay, okay, okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, um, we're gonna do two minutes for each candidate again. Um, oh. Eight, you're both H's. So Emily Hellstrom is H-E. So Emily, you're gonna speak first. You're gonna get two minutes, okay? Great. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Does anyone else want to run for vice president of the council? Or want to, or does anyone wanna nominate someone else? Okay, so um, I'm closing the nominations, officially closed. And now I'm giving Emily two minutes 
to uh, make a statement. Hi, um, I'm Emily Hellstrom, and um, I had thought about um, running for vice president uh, a little while back um, when uh, changes were occurring. And I feel like um, as the Students with Disability Chair um, and as somebody who I think can um, work with multiple people on the council um, from um, what seems like it's a bifurcated council, but I believe actually there's lots of consensus. Um, and I certainly think that I work well with Ed, um, although I also think Vincent is a fine candidate, um, which is why I took so long to put my name in the hat. But um, in the spirit of running for things, I think that um, I wanted to just throw my, my hat into the ring. Um, I would definitely uh, ask for your vote, uh, just because I, I do believe that I can bring energy. Um, I think I can um, help to bridge divides, hopefully. And um, most importantly, I think I can um, bring to the four voices who um, might not always be um, bubbling to the top. So um, I ask for your vote tonight, um, but either way, uh, I'm excited to be on this council. Thanks. Okay, thank you. And then uh, Vincent, are you ready? Uh, yes, uh, I'm just gonna say that I stand by my earlier comments for the uh, Office of President and just uh, I'm willing to serve in whatever capacity is best for the district, if that's, you know, okay. and uh, I will just leave it at that. But thank you for considering me for Vice President and uh, I ask for your vote. Okay, um, so we're gonna go through alphabetical order the same uh, as before. So um, I, I am first, Robin, I am voting for Emily. Eric? Uh, Emily Hellstrom. Um, Emily? Uh, Emily? Emily, I vote for myself. Okay. Um, Vincent? Um, well, I'm, I'm voting yeah. for myself. Although Emily would make a fine vice president as well. Thank you. Okay. Um, Ed. I vote uh, for Emily. I think it's important that we have women, uh, a strong woman like Emily. Um, Maud. Vote for Vincent. Ben. I vote for Vincent. Oh. Bushma. Vote for Emily. Len. Len? Len, are you there? I will come back to you, Len. Um, Shino? Emily. Um, Tom? Lost hundreds of thousands of dollars due to slander, Vincent Tom. Um, and Len, are you here? Can you hear me? Yes. I abstain. OK. So that means um, Emily has been selected as vice president of the council, and it means we now have an opening for secretary. Oh, wait. Where are we going? No, no, no. He's still secretary. Oh, excuse me. No, He's we're still full. secretary. We out. So yeah. I can't keep track of simple arithmetic or something. Okay, so. Um, We've closed out this portion of the um, of the meeting, and uh, next on the agenda is approval of the minutes. So, um, uh, Ed, I'm going to hand it back to you, and I'm just going to make a quick note that I'm looking through our uh, participant list, and I did see um, Gail Brewer joined us. So maybe after we uh, we approve the minutes, we can hear from Gail and then go into our public session. Great, so I guess um, we'll need a motion to approve the minutes. Do I hear a motion? Uh, I move to approve the minutes for September and October. I second that motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, the minutes are approved. Okay. And yeah. The first public session, I guess. This uh, Ushma, I get. I'll need some assistance here. Do we um, have? I'm just sorry. I just wanted to 
uh, interject that um, I thought we could hear from Gail Brewer. Oh, so I apologize. No, that's okay. I'm, I'm always listening to as many CECs as I can. I want to thank you because you are, uh, despite all the differences, I have to say the quality of your discussion and the intelligence of the members and the fact that you care so much about education. It's, it's uh, very, very impressive. Um, I can tell you that what we've been focusing on, you know, this, this device issue was endless. It's somewhat in two, but I can tell you even in five, we've been fundraising, it's that pathetic, just to get young people to have devices, not to mention the issue of bandwidth. Um, and in, um, we also have been focused on the social worker. I've been talking about this for, I don't know, 20 years. There's a little bit of movement from the mayor's office in terms of social worker in every single school. That's another focus that we've been uh, very, very uh, supportive of. And then we're trying to make sure that there is I know the biggest issue for two and others is what about the uh, the schools that uh, are screened and what about the why don't we come up with the, the test dates and so on and so forth. So we're working on that. I, I have a final say about that and all I can do is advocate. It's not very, but we, we also, um, another frustrating situation was that we allocated, I don't know, $15 million for the schools last fiscal year it was only a month ago that we were able to get OMB to agree to spend the money so whether it's two or other issues we are talking to OMB and the, and the uh, principals and superintendent and so on trying to move maybe some of the money from I don't know the bathrooms to the devices and to the technology because it's really not what it should be it's a constant constant challenge for students so those are some of the things we're working on um, but I'm always uh, trying to go into all the CECs. We uh, have had the superintendent, the executive superintendent come to the borough board every single month for the last couple of uh, months because uh, what's going on in the schools is of, of interest to the community boards as well as obviously the uh, council members. So I'm here and I will participate in any way that I can. Thank you. I'd like to look forward to hearing from the public. Thank you very much, President Brewer. Uh, point of order, may we ask questions to uh, Gail? If she doesn't mind taking a question or two. No, it's fine. I just, I don't want to delay you. No, yes. you won't. Um, can I just ask you what you think about Chancellor Kranz's performance post-COVID? Do you think it's been up to par with what we should expect? I'm critical of everybody. I'm not a good judge, to be honest with you. Um, I think that uh, between him and the mayor, the schools have not been given the support that you need. I'll leave it at that. There's a lot of challenges there. But I've been doing this work for a long time. And if you sit there, and just make criticism, not do anything about it. So I've done everything I can on the social, emotional, and the. I happen to come from the tech community. So on the tech front, because those are the two things I know how to uh, advocate for. So I'm just going to leave it at that. We'll have a different situation hopefully in a year, we'll see. Hopefully. Thank you very much, thank you. Okay. So on our speaker list. I'm sorry, Ishma, I'm gonna interject once more that we have another special guest, uh, which is uh, Marisol Rosales, our executive superintendent. And uh, she would also like to introduce herself and say a few words. She's hey. recognized, yes. Hey, everybody. I'm no special guest, but uh, it's really good to be here in community with District 2. I do want to say thank you to our Manhattan Bar President, and I do want to acknowledge her because she was actually the very first stakeholder across Manhattan who um, tried to allocate some funds for devices and technology. So, um, Gail, thank you so much for, for your advocacy always. I do want to congratulate you, Ed and Emily. You have my full support. Any way I can help you, please count on me. Um, and I do want to say that, you know, in the midst of this pandemic, I am incredibly thankful and hopeful. Um, it, this pandemic has taken so much from all of us and, and, it, and, it, and it has also taught us so much. Um, it isn't just a health crisis, it's a fiscal crisis. We've seen inequities, how they have been elevated. Uh, and so as educators, we have a professional and a moral responsibility to think differently and, and, and innovatively as to how we educate our children and what better place to do that than, than District 2. Our amazing principals, teachers, our superintendent, our team just do incredible work. 
Um, and I also want to say that we have an opportunity with this new grading policy, right? And uh, our digital curriculum to think in innovative ways. Uh, we can never go back to the way we used to educate children. Uh, we need to move forward and we need to do it with a lot of compassion and expectations. Um, I do want to congratulate our district too for being the recipients of the New York State Integration Grant. And there's one more opportunity for us to redefine education uh, by engaging various voices and multiple perspectives um, in an effort to create highly effective schools for all of our students. So I really look forward to partnering on the design and implementation of the grant. Um, as well as to listening from the community and, and just be of support. So thank you very much, everybody. It's great to be here in community with you all. Thank you very much. Okay, Ushma. So our speaker list um, as follows is Luke Wolf from Scott Stringer's office, then Elka Samuel Smith, Chen Kwok, et cetera, as you can see, um, I have, I'm logged in twice. One is my phone showing the speakers list. So see where you are in the order. Um, and I also listed at the top the information for where you can sign up to speak. If you would like to add your name, you can also find a link to that off of cecd2.net. So without further ado, Luke, please go ahead. Hi everyone. Um, I'm Luke Wool from City Controller Scott Strainer's office. I want to start by congratulating the uh, new officers and look forward to continuing to work with all of you going forward. Um, I think our office knows how tumultuous this school year has been for so many across our city, which is why I've been hard at work to uh, try to support students and families uh, to make it the uh, best learning experience we can have given these new and uh, difficult conditions. Um, so much of our work as the borough president mentioned has been focused on doing everything we can to make sure students have internet access. Uh, we know that with all students engaging in remote learning this year, access to technology is a key factor in all students ability to get an education. Um, so first the controller sent a letter to the mayor and Chancellor Carranza urging the city to act immediately on closing the digital divide, which we know affects over 100,000 students each day in New York City. Um, so the controller proposed uh, that the city offers subsidized and redeemable internet passports for low-income families to purchase broadband service from providers in their area. Uh, this would help to ensure that students without internet do not fall further um, behind in their coursework and find themselves at a deeper, dis uh, deeper educational disadvantage. Um, we are also focused on supporting our students in shelter. There are over 13,000 students and family shelters across the city, almost all of whom do not have internet access. So we sent, uh, we wrote an op-ed with Advocates for Children, laying out a blueprint for the city to make sure that they have the access to internet and technology they need. We've also been working to uh, make sure we're strengthening the city school system going forward. Um, so over the pandemic, the pause in the capital plan has meant that $900 million of money which was supposed to go to capital funding for schools has now not been spent. So we are urging the city to continue uh, spending in the capital program to make sure that we are preparing our schools for the future. And we don't end up with outdated or too few educational facilities because right now we are not making the investments we need. Lastly, um, the Comptroller launched a survey with an organization called the Better Balance to try to figure out how families and parents are responding to the pandemic in terms of their work and family balance. I'll drop that survey in the chat. It only takes about five minutes or less to complete. So we'd really appreciate if all you could uh, give that a look and fill that out because we want to learn more about how families are responding during the pandemic. Thank you. I just disabled the chat, Luke. So you're going to have to distribute it somewhat well, all right, I'll uh, send it to, I'll email it to the board members. If you all could help distribute it, that would be great, but thank you. Thank you. Next, um, Elka Samuel Smith. Yes, good evening. My name is Elka Samuel Smith. I'm a second term PTA co-president at PS51, an SLT member at Environmental Studies High School. Uh, my opinions expressed tonight are my own. I just wanted to express my concerns about DOE inconsistencies about what has been promised. Um, I would hope that as a community, our immediate efforts would be to apply pressure to make sure that all of our kids without devices and Wi-Fi access receive it immediately. Um, I did hear about some effort to use school buses. I'm not sure how far that went. Uh, and I hear a lot of ideas floating around, but I'd like to see some concrete action points um, in order to make that happen. Also, I wanted to speak to the opt-in period um, that was also an inconsistency in terms of what was promised. I think it's really unfair to expect parents 
to commit to return now while COVID is literally on the rise in our neighborhoods. It's not going to solve the issue of trying to um, be more consistent with the staff members. In fact, it's probably gonna cause a greater issue. I foresee that more parents are going to actually opt in and not attend because of the attendance policy this year. And they're not gonna send their kids in, period, until they feel safe. I also feel that it's completely inconsistent that while the DOE is not enforcing the testing policies that they promised of all the kids that are in blended learning, sorry, New York City, that they are requiring testing opt-in for anybody who's now opting in. I, I just feel like it's crazy, all of the back and forth, and I'm hoping that we are advocating for clarity and consistency on behalf of the communities that need it most. Thank you very much. All right, I don't see Chen Kwok in the um, participants list. If you're here, please raise your hands. So we will move on to Jessica Schwartz. Jessica, please unmute yourself. I cannot unmute you. Okay, then I believe the next um, person who's here is Amanda J. If that's you, Amanda Jahizi, please unmute yourself. Um, hello, um, I'm a district to public school parent. And um, I guess one of the questions I have, I mean, I'd, I'd like to speak to, but um, I do have a question for you guys, um, which is um, why we are not making a harder push to open the K through five uh, schools, the elementary schools for five days a week in person learning as soon as possible. Um, there is no dispute that in person learning is superior to remote. For young children, remote learning can actually be harmful, causing children to sit and stare at screens for hours without social interaction. Tired eyes, fidgeting, feelings of isolation, anxiety and depression are only some of the negative effects of remote learning substituted for in-person. Numerous studies have shown elementary schools are not a source of coronavirus spread. In fact, New York City schools have a lower infection rate than the city at large. And as countries in Europe, including the UK, Ireland, Belgium, France, et cetera, have shut down due to increase in case, they have kept the schools open. They've shut down all non-essential business, asked residents to leave their homes only if necessary, yet they've kept the schools open. And I feel that we are damaging our youngest students by unnecessarily keeping the elementary schools in a hybrid model. The K through five schools should be open full-time for five days a week in person learning as soon as possible. And um, I, you know, I honestly, when I listen to the mayor, I'm wondering, are we actually going to open full time in 2021? I mean, these children are falling behind. There was a study today put out by the UK um, that the children were regressing because, um, you know, they were not in school and the, just the effects of coronavirus isolating the children. Um, you know, this is a situation where what we're the small I mean I don't know what the risk is that we're trying to avoid but the damage that we're inflicting to these children far outweighs whatever you know risk we're just trying to make zero essentially thank you Amanda um I still don't see Chen um, so Jessica Schwartz if you are here and can hear us please unmute yourself this is the last call for Jessica Schwartz. Okay, um, then the next person I could find in the participants list is Faiza Maji. Faiza, are you available? All right, Faiza. I hope I am not butchering your name. 
Five of them, Aji. I see you've unmuted yourself. Please go ahead. I unmuted her. Oh. <laughs> I'm not sure she's available. Um, so Kaushik, Kaushik Das, are you with us? I am, uh, sorry, my comments, I intended to speak to comments made, recent comments made by the chancellor, as well as uh, Mayor de Blasio regarding uh, screens and missions regarding middle schools. However, I think it'd be remiss not to address one of the guest speakers in the room. Um, Ms. Brewer, uh, there have been, and I, this is not divisive, I think it speaks to the core of a major issue last month. Um, I think it, she must address many emails and comments that were sent to her, as well as no less than 50 speakers that spoke to this point last meeting about the eligibility of her borough appointee, <clears throat> Shino Tanakawa. I think it is a valid concern. It has been respectfully asked by many people it has certainly grown in demand, but is nonetheless respectful. I don't see why we should lose chat over this or why this issue should not be addressed. Thank you. Thank you, Kaushik. Um, so this is a last call for our first public speaking session. Oh, Gail, I see you have turned well, your- Well, if you want me to answer, I can just very quickly, I have many emails on both sides just so you know and i will address it not this moment because this is not the time but i have hundreds of emails on both sides just so you know all right thank you i'm sure you do but many of them speak to her eligibility period which the other side does not matter really thank you thank you kaushik um all right so this is a last call for chen kwok jessica schwartz mark grabesa Jane Burke or Faiza Maji. If any of you are here and listening. Hi, sorry, I'm here. Jessica, please go ahead. Yes. <laughs> Hi, sorry. Um, to be honest, I haven't listened for the past hour. I've had some stuff I'm dealing with, but my um, what I wanted to say was about the hybrid that has been suddenly taken away from us. The ch choice of, you know, opting in three times in a year instead of just once. And, you know, I was wondering if you guys know of anything that might change back or there's any way to change it back. It's just, you know, really hard. Like, as you said in the beginning, right now it's day to day and no one has any idea what's going to be going on in three months. If Corona is going to get amazing, if it's not, and how could a parent make a decision, you know, today, if they want their kids to go to school or not, I meant, you know, in school or not, today for February. I, I just don't understand that. And I don't know if you guys have any pull or, you know, any say or, you know, any way, but I, I just don't understand how that's okay. And have you heard anything else about that or it's just, you know, I'm a single mom and it's like right now I'm working remote, but what happens if three months from now the vaccines are out and everything's great in the world and my boss is like, you have to come back to work. And I choose, didn't choose hybrid. What do I do? Like what is mo you know, like there's so many families that are in the same position. Sorry, <laughs> it's not about this, it's about something else. Anyway, so that's what I wanted to say. Thank you, Jessica. Um, stay tuned for a resolution that's coming up. Um, okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, but we um, just for a point of record, the council members do not reply to questions that are usually do not reply to questions that are asked during the public speaking session. Um, so I okay, can well, thank you and anyway, thank you. <laughs> still see Chen, Mark, Jane in the participants list. Faiza, if you can hear us, please unmute yourself. Otherwise, I see that Stefan Lautner has raised a hand. So Stefan, please go Hi, ahead. Hi, this is Faiza. Oh, Faiza, please go for it. Um, so I, I wanted to ask about the gifted and talented test. I know there's a lot of conversation. If, if, if anyone's heard anything about it, you know, I think there were 33,000 families last year who took the g &T test for incoming kindergartners. Um, and my family, like many others, is very stressed, wondering if anything's happening. So is there any news? Thank you. 
Thank you, Faiza. To the point. Um, Stefan, you're next. Thanks, Sushma. Um, I don't know if you guys can hear me or not. Um, I, I want to follow up on Kashik's comments and, and address my questions and comments to, uh, to Borough President uh, Brewer. Um, and it was something that was respectfully put in the chat that, you know, your political appointee signed under oath, under penalty you know, of perjury, an oath to collaborate with other members of the council, yet wrote a, an open letter specifically stating the opposite which I think calls into question her eligibility to stay on the council. So council, uh, you know, uh, Borough President Brewer, do you have any comments on that? I, mean, there's, I don't think there's anything to the opposite that can be said. The silence unfortunately speaks volumes. Gail, you're on mute. I'm sorry, I'm on another Zoom also. So I, I'm not going to, I think I'm just going to leave it that I am aware of the situation and I will deal with it. And I'm very conscious of what you have to say. And I will go back to everybody. Thank you. Hey, my comment then to, 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 to Marisol Rosales is that there, there's, a, there's a, a complaint lodged with DOE Legal and it has yet a month later been unresolved. So it's disappointing to, to see that, you know, things are unresolved and we move on as if nothing happened and as if no as if no complaint was filed with DOE legal and we move on with the you know with quote unquote the work of the council thank you stefan uh, thank you gail um next to speak i see kulani jenkins has raised their hand kulani. hi yeah kulani here um i'm a parent at and pta board member at ps51 and i just wanted to uh back up Elka who spoke earlier um, we're really concerned about our students who cannot get access to the internet or devices and um, and our families who are uh, struggling and in agony over whether or not uh, to opt in now and not suddenly not having uh, choices to do so later on as was promised so I uh, just want to put that out there and uh, you know, make sure we can support these families. Thank you, Colin. Um, last to speak or the last person with their hand up and in our Google form is Taj Sutton. Taj, please unmute yourself. Good evening. Can you hear me? You can. Okay, thanks so much. Um, I'll be super brief. Um, I was present at the last meeting. Um, I chose not to speak because as I've explained before, when I attend um, CEC2 meetings as a guest, not a CEC2 member, um, or... <clears throat> Can you please go away, someone? I'll wait a bit. Okay, thanks. Um, in short, I just wanted to encourage folks to really focus on issues um, like the parent before me was addressing in terms of who are our most marginalized students. Um, because we are seeing the same issues citywide, right? In District 14, we are also having issues around internet access, around language access, right? Um, and coming together around those issues as opposed to um, really focusing our energy on things that affect a, a small number of students um, who are relatively, you know, they're not life or death issues, right? GNT, yes, we want students to have access to individualized education, of course. But when we look at the scope of what's going on in our world right now and in our city, um, that should not be the focal point. And I just, I really encourage everyone to think bigger and outside of themselves, outside of their own families and districts. And I also would just remind folks, um, a lot of the conversation at the last CEC2 meeting was around legitimacy, right? And I think that continuing to be the dead horse in terms of this borough appointee who Gail Brewer selected, right? I think we forgot that. Like she was legitimate enough to get the position, maintain it and do fantastic work on CEC2 with her CEC2, excuse me, CEC2 council, despite all of the drama we've seen unfold month after month, right? Work is still getting done, really good work oftentimes led by the individuals on this council that are slandered at every meeting. And they continue to show up to do the work for children, right? Not for themselves, not for political gain, but because we care about kids. Um, so hearing someone say, there's no validity to uh -huh. this woman being on the council, uh -huh. you know, it kind of flies in the Thank face you. of that whole uh -huh. argument about every voice uh -huh. being heard. You're at your time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
Superintendent, uh, Executive Superintendent Rosales wants to address the, um, the device issue. So, yeah, Matt, hi. Can you hear me? Sure. If that if that's okay, I could definitely provide um, uh, some information from a, from a borrowed perspective. Um, in addition to the superintendent who, who is here. I mean, I, I just wanna know that uh, I know Central purchased an additional 100,000 iPads that are being distributed to our most vulnerable populations for sure. So students in temporary housing, um, foster care, our special education students. Um, I also know that there's definitely a, a nationwide device shortage. So while the DOE has put in for another um, request, everybody else is doing the same thing. I do know that they're prioritizing New York City, but I do wanna speak a little bit about sort of um, devices that are not functioning properly. Those devices could be returned directly to the school. Each school has a point of contact for technology uh, that is working directly with our help desk at Central. Uh, and we are working with Apple Care to help repair those devices and return them to school. Um, by all means, please contact our superintendent, uh, Donalda Chamney, and myself. Uh, contacted me at any time, mfrosalis7 um, at the DOE, and I can definitely put you in contact with um, some of our tech support. Happy to do that for sure. Thank you. Um, anyone else, Robin? Otherwise, we've got Lupe Hernandez, Bura, Kathy Ringrose, and Anna Saparito. So, uh, Lupe, I think you're first on the list. Hi, thank you for your time. I just wanted to um, echo support for Shino. I know she's done a lot of work for those that have really needed their support. Um, and I appreciate her focus while on this council, along with some other council members on the children and not the divisiveness. I also wanted to speak about the resolution in regards to opting in person learning. Um, as, a, as a parent of a student with a disability, um, it is important that I think this whole plan have more time to be planned. I think this was not well thought out in the summertime. I think we all as parents echoed that concern. And um, it really did concern me. I would much rather there be more time put into parents being able to decide whether their child opts in and even the possibility what Elka and I think one other parent had said, possibly getting children with disabilities, especially K through five in five days out of the week. Um, I know what's, what he's been going through with nine kids in the class has really been working well for him. I just don't know how much that will adjust once more children are opting into in-person learning. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bureau Kathy Ringrose. Thank you. Um, I just want to say that I'm, I'm a parent coordinator and I come and I'm an advocate for parents. And when um, the, the doors closed in March, I had to keep a strong face for all my parents, but I was scared and I needed to get technology. I needed to have all my parents get food. I needed a lot of things and I was scared. And the one person I could turn to was Gail Brewer. And she, we would have conversations in the middle of the uh, middle of the night, um, one o'clock in the morning. I text her with concerns, and she came through. I just want to personally thank her. And Marisol, I want to thank you too because I know you're behind her. Thank you so much. But I was scared, and I'm a parent coordinator, and I shouldn't be saying that. But I had 600 parents I had to answer to, and uh, maybe 1,200 and 600 kids to be responsible for. And Gail was there, so I just want to thank her. Thank you for letting me say that. Thank you. And I, I'm sure Gail heard you. Uh, Anna Saparito and then Lilibeth Feliciano. So Anna, Anna Saparito, please. Hi, thank you. I'm a parent at uh, PS41 uh, District 2. And I just wanted to say a few things. The first thing I wanna say is I wanna congratulate the team that worked so hard to secure the integration grant. 
Donalda, Maude, and others. I think their hard work paid off and their commitment, and I think that's so awesome. Um, as a parent, I find it so troubling when non-parents try to silence parents just because they disagree with them. I've worked with Maude in many settings and have the utmost respect for her. I'm also disappointed to hear Marisol Rosales strongly supporting some council members. I think all voices should be welcome. Um, yeah, that's it. Have a wonderful night, guys. Thank you for your help. Okay, uh, so this is the last call. Otherwise, Lilibeth Feliciano is the last speaker that we have. Lilibeth, are you with us? I don't believe so. Um, signing up via the Google form and not showing up is the name of the night. Um, okay, last call if Lilibeth, Chen, Mark, or Jane are here. All right, and I will leave the link up for where you can sign up for the second public speaking session, but the first public speaking session has come to a close. Thank you, Ushmer. We, we also have uh, speaker Paul J. Thompson, principal at Bard Early College at the Urban Assembly School of Music and Art. Um, is he here with us tonight? He's going to speak about his program. That is Paul J. Thompson. Yes, can everyone hear me? Yes. Is it working? Great, thank you so much um, for giving me the opportunity to speak uh, to you. Sitting in, in the beginning of your meeting, I just wanna come in the elections, um, an election. Uh, that you all had went off well, and uh, it sounds like you guys are grappling with um, the problems of our day. Um, I think this is a, a good segue. Uh, I'm the founding principal of the Urban Assembly School of Music and Art. Uh, we are starting our 16th year. We are located in downtown Brooklyn. Um, in my time in the DOE, I've worked with many folks, and I see some familiar faces here tonight, so good evening. Um, but about three years ago, we started a very unique program that I think your parents might want to hear about. Um, uh, we started a, a, a partnership with the Bard Early College. Now, most people are familiar with the two Bard uh, Early College high schools that exist in New York City. Uh, they're great programs, um, but uh, they, they are very, very, very competitive and difficult to get into. Um, and as a founding principal for a non-screen high school, I also happened to be a Bard alum who was also a student of the president. Uh, and I'm also on the board of governors. And so I've been um, counseling uh, the Bard Early College uh, in their relationship to um, really work harder at providing uh, deeper access to their two high schools here in New York City to folks of color and children with disabilities. Um, part of that gave birth to this experiment that we've really incubated uh, at my school, which is essentially, um, we have a satellite BARD Academy where we have BARD professors teach college courses, the same college courses they would get at either one of the two BSECs. Um, and it's taught to 11th and 12th graders. So students have the opportunity to graduate um, with up to over, over 12 credits um, of, with a barred transcript. So it comes from Annandale. Uh, it is signed by the registrar up there. Um, and it, 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 it works in conjunction with their high school diploma. So when they graduate, they obviously graduate from high school. They also graduate with these credits. It is technically not an early college program. So it should not be confused. Students do not graduate from our program with an associate's degree, but they do sit and take college classes um, with a barred professor. Um, it's been a remarkable experience, I think, for them and for us. It is proven that you can have a barred professor teach college classes to an unscreened population of students. Um, and that is what my life's work has been about. I was a founding teacher uh, at BSEC in Manhattan when it started in Greenpoint. And when I had the opportunity to open a school, 
16 years ago, um, the school I wanted to open was for students who um, traditionally the system uh, excludes from programs like BSEC. So um, we are in the third year of this experiment and uh, I'm really just trying to advertise it and let people know uh, that this is really one of the best kept secrets <laughs> in town um, because we do not have a screen. So students apply, we go through the same uh, selection process that, that schools go through, um, but it, it is not predicated on students having uh, grades. It is not predicated on state test scores. Um, we are a Title I school. Many of our students are coming in um, level one, level two, low level threes. Um, and we are remarkably able to work our program so that opportunity is available and offered to all 11th graders. Um, and we're graduating students with IEPs through this BARD program. So I appreciate the opportunity. Um, I'm inspired by your work. It sounds as though uh, this, this committee uh, is, is working with knotty issues. And so um, we are tossing our hat in the ring uh, in, 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 in that vein, um, because we really, uh, we, we really believe in fighting the segregated nature uh, of our system. And so providing the highest quality experience for all students uh, is paramount to our mission. So with that, I, uh, I appreciate the opportunity. I don't wanna take up too much time. Um, I don't know if there's questions. I'm not sure how you guys deal with this. I do have some stuff I could drop into the chat like a PDF um, that explains uh, the program and gives you some data stats if that would be valuable uh, to your members. Uh, the chat's disabled, so if I could, maybe I can email them. Um, I will email it to you. I see the thumbs up. So we will email them and get those stats out to you uh, as quickly as possible. You can also go to our website, uh, which is uamusicandart.org. Uh, and you should be able to see pretty much anything I would email you there on the website. So, Great. Thank you very much. Vincent, did you have a question? Yeah, I just wanted, uh, I've been getting some of your solicitations and could you just confirm the geographic location of this um, your music school or your music and art school? So we're a music and art school. That's what we're founded on. And really, uh, we're not a conservatory. I want to make that clear for everyone. Really, the, the arts are a vehicle for us to really be able to tap into students' voice so that the academic experience is something that's personal and relevant to them. And so that is really the concept that we were founded on. Um, to answer your uh, original question, we are located in downtown Brooklyn. We are literally at the foot of the Manhattan Bridge. We are accessible to all of the train lines um, from Manhattan, uh, from Brooklyn. Um, so, you, you know, if you're familiar at all with Borough Hall um, in downtown Brooklyn, um, we're, we're in walking distance to that. Okay. Um, we're in a converted loft building. I was very, very lucky that when we opened um, 16 years ago, we, we moved into brand new refurbished space. So really we, we, we occupy the two top floors, seventh and eighth floors with panoramic views of the city. Uh, there, there's, there's never a problem having meetings in my building because everyone loves the view. Ed, I had a question as well. Yeah. Um, so uh, you said that this is not a screen. It sounds like a wonderful program, by the way. Uh, thank, thank you. You. Um, you said it was not a screen program, but students apply. Um, what, what is the application process based on then? Uh, is there a preference for any student geographically or otherwise? So um, we're all, our, our geographics it, our codes are all city. So we will take students from um, all five boroughs. Um, technically, well, we were founded as with no screen. A few years ago, that has sort of shifted. And so we are what would be called op-ed or ed-op, um, which means essentially students apply, 
we are one of 12 schools that they would want to list that they want to go to. It's totally different than the, um, the screened process that you go through to, you know, go to LaGuardia or go to the Bard BSEC, um, at which, you know, those have specific application processes uh, that you have to do through the school. Um, there are no test scores. So like, unlike Stuyvesant, Brooklyn Tech, right, you don't have to take the Shazat. Literally, all you need to do is when you pick your program and your 12 choices, which your guidance counselor will help you, you know, go through, all you need to do is pick us as your top choice. And then um, we have no control. There's an algorithm that really controls who, where students land in the process. Um, but you have a higher degree of, of uh, getting into the program if you pick us as your first choice. So if uh, you're oversubscribed with uh, first choice uh, applicants, it would be pure lottery then? Um, the whole process is controlled by the algorithm in the lottery. Okay. So, um, you know, if we had, I mean, we have, let's say we have a hundred seats, we have 108 seats. Wow. If 200 people apply, there's a lottery process. If a hundred people apply, the lottery process is still in play because the hundred kids also applied to other schools. And so I've had this explained to me many times by the people who have created the algorithm, but the algorithm is constantly rejiggering. So you can never guarantee um, the outcome of who actually lands on uh, your enrollment list. Okay. The, the key though is. <laughs> <laughs> right. There, there are people with with uh, <laughs> uh, there. There are more experienced people on this call than I who might know that. <laughs> fair enough. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, certainly. Thank you very much, Mr. Thompson. Thank you. I appreciate the time. Everyone, be safe and have a good evening. Next on the agenda is the report of the president. Now I. Uh, don't have much of a, of a report, uh, only to say that we have uh, been told that we have been approved for the integration grant. And I look forward to hearing from the superintendent uh, concerning the plan uh, for uh, this integration grant. Um, what is the plan for community engagement? Um, what is the breakdown of how the money is going to be allocated? How are we going to achieve the goal of integration and diversity in our schools uh, with the help of these resources? So um, having said that, um, I will uh, turn now to the report of the superintendent, Ms. Chumley. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, everybody. I hope that you all are doing well this evening. Um, good evening, council members, parents, community members, and District 2 educators, especially very hardworking principals. I see that you're on this call. Thank you so much for being here and for supporting our students and our schools. Um, to uh, President Arizari's point, uh, the New York State Education Department awarded our district well, actually many districts in the state, $19.4 million in grant funding uh, to pursue integrated schools and classrooms. Um, and this was announced on October the 23rd by Interim Commissioner Betty Rosa. The New York State Integration Program Professional Learning Community Grants are intended to create school communities where all students have access to equitable and high quality education. The phase three announcement of this funding effort um, awarded funds to six New York City districts, two in Manhattan, districts two and three, two in Brooklyn, districts 13 and 15, and two in Queens, districts 24 and 30. Our district's award is $2,688,562 over the course of the next three years. 
We are committed as, as a district to promoting increased integration within our district's community schools and embracing the students' racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic, linguistic, and ability diversity as important educational assets. And that is the language of Commissioner Rosa. These funds will help District 2 to develop exciting and effective strategies that fit the needs of our unique students and communities. I am grateful to the 20 plus members of the phase two planning team and all their hard work. And I would like to extend special gratitude to Deputy Superintendent Marianne Shepard, who has worked so hard on this effort for the past several years. This is really passion work for Marianne and for all of us. And Marianne prioritizes and eliminating disproportionate outcomes in everything that she does. Truly, these resources are so important and the work that they sponsor is crucial to our effort to ensure that every child has access to the inclusive curricula and rigorous teaching that they deserve. So I received some questions from um, President Irizarry a few days ago that council members had raised and I'd like to address them now. The first question was, the New York State Education Department announcement mentioned that the deadline to complete the phase two uh, work has been extended to February 2021 because of the pandemic, presumably for those districts that were awarded phase three funding. Does district two need this extension? And if so, what are the remaining phase two deliverables and your plan for completion? So the answer to that question is that our district was automatically granted this extension along with all other phase two districts that receive funding. There are no remaining phase two deliverables. The second question was, what is the district's plan for community engagement? How does the district plan to engage stakeholders that aren't connected to PTAs, SLTs, the district leadership team, the community education council, et cetera? And I just want to let you all know, I'm in conversation with the other superintendents that have been awarded this particular grant. And having just received this news, the district team and I are working on our plan for community engagement. I'll keep you informed and I will of course seek your feedback. The third question, what is the process for modifications to the approved plan based on feedback? The answer, the state has not yet articulated this process. The fourth question, in the past, NICE had provided specific and detailed feedback on submissions. Can you share their feedback document on the phase three plan? So I'd like to share that all feedback that we have received thus far in our entire journey as a NICE team um, is available on our Community School District 2 website, which can be found at www.district2nyc.org. So all feedback that we've received from the state is available and linked there. You can see the entire evolution of our plan. We have not received written comments on the phase three submission, um, only that it was accepted and that we are awarded the funds. And when we do receive um, Communication from NYSED, it will be posted on the website. What is the, the, this is the last question. What is the breakdown for how the money will be allocated? Will third party vendors be engaged? So there are very specific budgeting requirements that are specified in the grant. Third party vendors will be engaged and we will share information about these partners as it becomes available. Ronaldo, you're muted you're again. Yeah. So sorry. Okay. I'm am I back? Can you hear me now? Okay. Thank you so much, Ishma. Okay. So um that concludes the, the questions that were submitted to me in advance. Um, teachers and principals, uh, folks who are on this call tonight, I thanked you last month for bringing the schedules and academic programs to life in your school buildings for all of our students. And parents, uh, I've heard your commentary this evening, and I want you to know that we really value your collaboration and feedback about how remote learning and blended learning is going for your child. And we are all working to optimize success. There is an opt-in period. Many of you um, on this call in the public comment section had mentioned 
that there's an opt-in period for all parents and students that concludes on November 15th, only a few days from now. At this time, school leaders and their teams are working to reformat the instructional programs and groupings that are currently in place to accommodate students who will be rejoining their peers at school. We want to have all children at school in person as often as possible. And we are committed to ensuring that the quality of instruction that students receive on a daily basis is consistently high. Our district review team, specifically two folks I'd like to shout out, Kelly Licata and Kristen Smits, our academic policy lead, have been instrumental in collaborating with principals to optimize the number of days that students can be at school. Um, you know, there's a saying that the universe is conspiring in your favor. And if you're an optimist, I guess you believe that. I definitely do. Um, and I want to assure you that we are all, by we, I mean people who work at the Department of Education, are all working our butts off to make sure that we are conspiring in your favor, parents and kids, because we want you to be in school as much as possible. And, and it is a very, very tough time. I know that you know we've, we've seen our COVID rates, our citywide average climbing up a little bit. Um, there may be, there may be some, some hurdles, um, but as one of the speakers mentioned earlier tonight, our schools are safe places for kids to be. They are, when we have random testing, we are not finding um, any type of even moderate incidence of cases. Um, people are healthy and kids are secure. It's a good, it's, we're running tight safety protocols and we really want to get kids back where they belong in school. And so your consistent effort and everybody's contributions around uh, flexibility are very appreciated. Um, it would be wonderful if we could uh, proceed through this in a way that allows us to have school functioning again for every child every day. So we're working, we're working on that. Um, and so just know that the data is available. Um, you know, you, if you're talking to anyone who works at your school at pick up and drop off, um, you're seeing and hearing about um, the folks who are opting in, um, how large the cohorts can be, how large the room sizes can accommodate, um, how many uh, cohorts there will be within your school. Hopefully they're shrinking. That means that your students are coming to school more often um, and, and, and principals are reworking that now. So I'm going to move to some teaching and learning updates. Uh, today we had another follow-up meeting with, one second. Okay. Um, we had a, a parent meeting today that um, with our Office of District Planning um, and some folks from enrollment and some folks from the Division of Multilingual Learners and parent leaders, Stefan Lautner, Nadia Levy, Maud Marin, and quite a few other folks um, who were advocating um, again to establish a French dual language kindergarten program in our district to continue the dual language pre-K that we previously established last year. So we're looking for a site for that kindergarten program. And we have, I think it's like well over a hundred people who are on the waiting list for the pre-K seats. And the interest is as high this year going into next um, as it was last year. So more will be revealed on that as we are able to move forward. Uh, we have received an update on grading policy for this school year, and that information has been shared and will continue to be shared by teachers and uh, the principal at your children's school. If the council would like more information on this grading policy, please let me know and I can prepare a more comprehensive presentation for our next meeting. I want to let you know that we're undertaking a special inquiry as a community of educators in our district around culturally responsive teaching and assessment practices during this time of blended instruction. Uh, previously, I mentioned that we were continuing our partnership with Cass and Cornelius Minor, and today we had a principals meeting where those folks were um, walking us through what a school culture assessment protocol looks like that examines children's and families and teachers attitudes and um, experiences with assessment and evaluation and grading 
um, as a part, as a component of the school experience that either promotes success for all students or um, denies students pathway to, to really excel uh, and reach their full potential. And so we're looking um, closely at those practices together as a community and always looking to provide high impact and high quality teaching and opportunities for students to access all of the instructional supports that they require to be successful. Um, as of today, we do not yet have further information about middle school and high school admissions. However, our district team is working with principals to ensure that all school websites have ample information and virtual information sessions so that prospective students and families may gather the information they need. I'd like to thank Jennifer Greenblatt, our family leadership coordinator for her work with middle school principals around this. We want to make sure that there's a streamlined effort um, among school leaders and that the information presented is, is coherent um, and, and consistent in its format uh, so that, that folks who are looking across our district's 20 middle schools can get uh, a, a, a take either a bird's eye view or a closer look in a way that is, that is consistent in format um, and the level of information that's available, um, the type of, um, for example, the tour of the school, um, the highlighted academic programs, um, and that each school has a presence that's virtual and inviting so that parents have access. A key component of this is language access and more will be discussed about that when we have um, those dates that that information will be available as the new pro process is articulated. Prior uh, to my talking on this call, Executive Superintendent Rosales had mentioned that the DOE has procured an additional 100,000 web-enabled iPads for students across the city. And we know that from my report last month, we our district had identified 1,119 students who have requested devices. So Tina Sabolkin-Yacker, our family support coordinator has been tracking attendance very closely and monitors the request for learning devices, the RLD report as it's known with, with us, um, very closely to figure out when have students received devices that were provided by their school or by council uh, or by borough president uh, Brewer's office or by city council office or by Scott Stringer's office because all of those um, electeds have been so generous with our students. We are checking in with every child and student, uh, every student and family to make sure that they have access to the instruction that is being offered um, in a synchronous or live way. Um, and in, case, in specific cases where internet access is a problem or devices are an issue, uh, teachers are checking in with students, uh, sending work packets home, recollecting them, checking in with families and students by phone. We have identified all of the students who need this level of service throughout our district. They are of highest priority. And hopefully within the next few weeks, we will have devices available and distributed for the kids who still need them. If there is anyone that you that you come across in your travels who is having challenges with devices, whether it's a repair issue, an access issue, figuring out the device, or whether it's something more complex like their own wireless connectivity, please let our district team know because we are happy to work with this with the student and the family to support them. We have tech support available and we also really want to connect with the school to make sure that all of the students who fit that profile are served at scale. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to share this information. I appreciate being here. Thank you very much, um, Superintendent Chumley. I want to recognize, I want to recognize Vice President Hel Helstrom, uh, Emily. Um, you do you have a report uh, for the uh, Students with Disabilities Committee? Uh, do you want to um, speak about your upcoming meeting and collaboration with the Remote Learning Committee? I'm sorry, do, do we get to ask uh, questions of the uh, superintendent first or? Uh, oh, I, I apologize. Are there any questions for the superintendent? I apologize. No, no problem. Uh, I, I have a few. Okay. Okay. Uh, just uh, quickly, uh, one of the major concerns of parents seems to be decisions being made day by day, no real foresight uh, involved here, seems to be haphazard decisions being made. And I just wanted uh, maybe to give you the opportunity to clarify whether those are decisions made by the schools really, or are they more higher level decisions made by the DOE? 
Tom, um, just so I'm super clear, can sure. you give me hybrid a couple learning. of examples? Sure, hybrid learning, something like that. Um, uh, something like, uh, I don't know, early voting at Wagner, having people come in, uh, something completely predictable, months and months in advance, controlled by the Board of Elections, true, but had the influence of the Chancellor's Office or some influence told them to go elsewhere, they would have done that in the time of a pandemic. So those decisions, are those, those aren't local decisions, right? Those are more Department of Education, higher up decisions, just to give the parents some comfort that it's not their principals making those decisions. Yeah, that's that's right. And in terms of early voting, you know, this council was very active in asking that early voting be removed from schools and right. looking for alternate locations. And okay. so that was that was not the preference of of, a, of ours to have to have voting happening in schools during the school day. Um, and with with regard to other decisions, uh, you know, opting back into hybrid learning. Uh, and other policy level decisions. Uh, I, th I think there are so many considerations that are made uh, for the entire system and, and just the incredible, um, incredibly diverse uh, set of, of assets and needs that our various communities have in place and what people face that you know those decisions are made at a central level Sure. Okay. Just one follow-up question. Sorry. Uh, the principals union voted uh, no confidence in the mayor and the chancellor in uh, late September. I just wanted to get a feel for how uh, principals in District 2 felt. Uh, did you see that it fell in line with the union? You know, I, I didn't at, I didn't engage with them on that, Tom. I did read that news article um, right. at that time, but we that wasn't that wasn't something we discussed. I'm sorry. No problem. Thank you. Hi. Any further questions? Any further questions? I, I just, yeah, I just had two quick questions. Sorry, did I interrupt someone? No. No, I was going to ask a question. It's Jane Burke. Oh, well. Um, so thank thank you for the report. Just just two quick questions. First is I think it's great um, that the district is putting together tools um, to allow parents to look across some of the different middle schools that'll be part of the application process. One request is if the schools could actually provide their course offerings so parents are clear on what classes each school is um, going to provide as part of their curriculum, I think that would be a really helpful data point uh, for parents as they're thinking through the decision. I know some schools potentially in eighth grade could offer algebra, others don't, some offer biology, some earth science. So I think just having that uh, really clear uh, would be very helpful. So if you could look into that, um, I think it'd be appreciated uh, by parents evaluating the schools. And then the, the second item is around uh, the implementation of the grading policy. I was just wondering if there's consistency across all the D2 schools uh, and whether they're gonna be implementing um, you know, this upgraded grading policy consistently at the, I guess, elementary and middle school level. So just those two questions. So for the first question, I just want to clarify, you're asking um, if, if middle schools are going to state their course offerings on their websites for, for, for admissions purposes or for yeah, think, information purposes? Yeah, I think it's just a really helpful point of information that sometimes parents aren't aware of is what the curriculum or course offering is at the schools. And I think it'd be, you know, an easy thing um, for the schools to, to post uh, what the current course, course offerings are. So do you, so the only thing that I could think that would be different across schools would be advanced academic programming, accelerated curriculum. Is that what you mean, Eric? Well, I mean, you would, you would know this better than I do. The only things I know of is that I know some schools offer, say, earth science in eighth grade, others offer biology, some do mm -hmm. algebra, some don't. I'm not exactly sure the combinations, I just know there's some differences. So you've just named three regents courses, integrated algebra, yeah. algebra one regents, biology regents, living environment regents, or earth science regents. And so I think what I hear you saying is that you would like to have it be very clear 
which middle schools are offering accelerated course offerings. Yes, that would be great if that's if that's if that's if that's what makes sense. If that's the distinction, um, that would be fantastic. I'm only I'm only just trying to clarify so that I can meet the need. Um, our 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 curriculum in in grades K through 12 is specified um, very closely by state academic policy, and over time, um, a great number of our middle schools have adopted Regents courses available to students in eighth grade. Um, and so the vast majority, I would say every school that we have offers an Algebra One Regents class in eighth grade for mathematics. Um, and then schools do offer in varying, um, varying ways. Um, usually it's living environment for science, but sometimes it is biology. Sometimes it is earth science, it depends. And sometimes it's multiple advanced and accelerated yeah. offerings. And so um, knowing that parents in our district are really interested in which schools are going to offer accelerated coursework and knowing that that's a priority, I appreciate you highlighting it. Yeah, and the other one would probably be language. I think certain schools have a different language program. So that's true. I think, yeah. I think with the link, what I'm finding out from trying to get this French dual language program or language enrichment model uh, uh, working um, or established in our district um, and, and providing language options is that so many schools offer language enrichment programming that is funded by PTAs. So I almost hesitate to want to advertise language availability or language programming um, when the source of that funding is disparate throughout from school to school. It almost sets up some schools to be more attractive than others due to the PTA's availability to provide funding for those teachers. Yeah, maybe but we I can't, could. But identify. I can advertise. Yeah. We certainly yeah. can do that. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's, yeah. I think that's super helpful. Yeah. And maybe we could identify where the funding is if you think that's valuable to understand the persistency of it or, or you know, the security of that offering. So, I don't know rating. that I would be able to yeah. develop that yeah. like a yeah. rating system for the security of the offering yeah. Uh, yeah. based on PTA yeah. funding. And I actually, I, I'm not sure, but I, I just wanna, I, I do want to give as much information to parents who are considering Great. schools as possible um, and about the academic offering specifically. Great. You had a second question and I'm so sorry yeah. that I- that yeah, I, It was just that on I the wait. consistency. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry. before go you go, I just wanna add to this discussion. There's a very variability in arts programming as well in middle schools across the district. So you can, if you can include that information, I think it'd be really important. Some schools Thank offer you. drama, some schools don't, so. And just a note on the PTA funding piece, uh, I, I believe that PTAs have to transmit the funds through the DOE. They can't directly hire uh, a, you know, a, a foreign language teacher or any type of teacher during the school day for that matter. So, I mean, I don't see how uh, releasing the foreign language would skew anything. I know they might have extra resources, but they might have less resources too because they don't get Title I funding. So, I mean, overall, those numbers are available, but just to make them a little bit easier to get, maybe we could work on that. I think that's a good idea, Tom. You're right. It does all have to funnel into the same right. into the pot in order for the budget to be executed. That's right. Right. Great. And the only other question was just, you know, you had mentioned taking time to talk about grading policy. Um, and I just didn't know if, if uh, and if we're able to get consistency across sort of the elementary and middle schools, or maybe there's a reason not to have that consistency, but I just wanted to um, get your view on it. Consistency is really important. And we've had, I think it, we're on our third meeting, um, unpacking the grading policy that was, that was, you know, just publicized and issued. And I, and I agree. I think all all elementary and middle schools understand um, the intent behind the grading policy uh, that exists now, and we are working to implement it um, consistently across all our district schools. Thank you. Okay. Point of order. Um, if so, um, and I'd like to uh, follow up with the superintendent. Um, so I just wanted to say on the. Um, as you raise the issue with, um, or the fact of the award of the New York State Integration Grant, 
Um, and um, having worked on that since 2018, first on the design team, uh, and then on the um, on the, the team that submitted this ultimate proposal. Um, I know Superintendent Chumney, you already mentioned uh, Marianne Shepard. I don't believe she's on this call, but she did do um, really incredible work in over the years and in many different ways. And so um, just to say thank you to her, but I'd also like to just point out um, that for those who don't know <laughs> that the, um, that, that final fate, that final grant submission um, that went in that has resulted in our district receiving this competitive grant to do this incredibly important work was submitted um, by the superintendent's team, completed by the superintendent and her team um, right after our schools closed. <laughs> so right after we switched to a remote learning model with almost no warning um, and district two being such an incredibly large district with 49 schools, um, the amount of work that went into um, overseeing that switch to remote learning and submitting this ultimately successful grant um, is really extraordinary. So I do say congratulations to Superintendent Chumney for um, that really very impressive amount of work. And um, on behalf of all of uh, the council and all the district, I thank you, um, you know, for that work. Um, and I do look forward to continued engagement in discussing, um, you know, what is a, I think a really great model for our district in that grant um, going forward. Um, and I think, Ed, if you're going to move on to committee reports. Um, uh, well, I, I uh, concur and I want to thank you, Maude, for all of your hard work on, on the grant. Thank you. Um, now we're moving on to committee reports. Um, any uh, reports from the uh, committee chairs? Well, I'm we don't have an official student and temporary housing chair. I can give you an update on that. Okay, give us an update, Tom. You can. Uh, you can. I mean, unless Ushima, you want to. You were de facto before, but I have some. Um, the only thing I'd say is tabling it until Emily announces an event that um, the remote learning students with disabilities and temporary exactly. housing are considering, but that's all. Okay. But I want Emily to, to talk about that because she's actually doing the work. Yes. All right, I recognize Emily now for that. Emily? Um, sure. I just, um, hi, everybody. I wanted to um, announce an event um, that I reached out to Ben and um, <clears throat> to Ushma, but Tom, also um, happy to have you um, sort of help do outreach for this. Um, it would be sort of an evening, a listening um, engagement um, about remote learning um, focused on finding out what is working and what is not. Um, this would be sort of centered around families participating, um, really um, being able to um, do a little bit of what we did tonight, which is to express themselves, um, you know, hopefully bring some things that are learning, uh, that are working, some things that are not. Um, and then we really commit to synthesizing this information. Um, I had reached out to Donalda and I know that she is very, very busy. So hadn't had a chance to get back to me yet, but hopefully we can have somebody from her office or herself. Um, she's always incredibly dedicated to coming to listen to parents um, and um, possibly even um, Michelle Chang uh, mentioned somebody from um, the DOE um, uh, the Office of Learning um, would, might be present. Um, and then we would commit to synthesizing that information and then bringing that um, in some form or another to the Chancellor's Town Hall, um, just because sometimes those Chancellor's Town Halls can be um, not as satisfying, I guess, um, just because they're a very big, um, overwhelming type of, of feel and that this might be something that's more intimate um, that we could really sort of glean some information that we could um, use to convey, um, you know, sort of what's working, especially as we go into the winter and possibly um, a rather long slog ahead of us. Um, so that is um, slated for Thursday, December 3rd at 6.30 p.m. Um, we're working on a one sheet um, and we'll certainly get that out um, through Yvette, who's always really great at, at pushing that out. Um, so that's that event. And then um, I just wanted to also announce um, that we have our November Students with Disabilities uh, meeting this Friday, November 13th at 3 p.m. on Zoom. Um, the information is also on our website. If you would like to um, join 
a, a mailing list sort of um, with a lots of updates that um, and some tips of the week and things like that, you can always go um, email me at SWD in NYC at gmail.com. Um, that's students with disabilities in NYC at gmail.com SWD. Um, and that's it. Thanks so much. Great. Okay. Uh, if there are no other reports from uh, I would like to speak on the students in temporary housing, if you don't mind. Okay. The chair recognizes Tom. Thank you. Ed. Uh, yeah, just some good news on that. Um, we were able to secure a donor uh, that donated twenty thousand uh, dollars. Myself and Jocelyn Anchor. Um, you know the what we did, what we contributed, of course, from the CAC went to. Uh, culturally responsive uh, books, um, which the kids can't read, uh, not all of them anyway. Uh, what we found was uh, they needed supplies, and uh, we went to all the shelters, uh, get, got lists of the supplies they needed, and it turned out uh, that what they needed more than anything uh, was equipment. So they needed Bluetooth headphones, because when you're in temporary housing, they're basically hotels, right? So you have multiple students and then maybe a parent working remotely in one hotel room. And when you have those Zoom calls or Teams calls or whatever they're uh, doing, uh, there's interference. So uh, I have a, had a connection at WB Mason and uh, we negotiated with them. We brought the cost of the headphones down from around $40 and they're very kind to give them um, to us for under $30. And we were able to purchase uh, 700 uh, headphones for Bluetooth wireless headphones for students in temporary housing, which they now have. That's equipment that they now have and they're able to learn more because of that equipment. And uh, I believe we should be doing more things like that. Uh, I would ask you to appoint me chair of uh, this committee so I could continue to hold meetings, to get more funds, to get people to donate and give it directly to the students in temporary housing and keep it out of the hands of the DOE who doesn't do anything. So, thank Excellent. you. Okay. All right, now we're gonna be moving on to the presentation and discussion of draft resolutions. Um, the first resolution is a resolution in support of demanding immediate guidance on 2020-2021 admissions process. That is uh, Robin's uh, resolution. Robin? Sure. Um we may not agree on how to do admissions, but I think we agreed on the fact that families should know what is going to happen this year. We all participated in conversations all spring. We were originally promised notice in June, then it got postponed to September, then the chancellor said by October, then they just sent out a notice saying disregard any deadlines. Um, and someone called in on Ask the Mayor on Friday and he said, we're still working on it. Um, there might be rumors that it's coming out this week. I don't know, but uh, I think we can all agree that this is just so stressful for families and it makes it impossible for schools to do planning. Even if schools that don't use screening are still impacted by the complete lack of information because everybody participates in the same uh, timeline. So it's just, another way to bang a pot and yell and say you owe us this information great the uh, second resolution in support of additional opportunities for families and opt into in-person learning tell us about that one so just like we heard from families tonight the doe originally offered you know a total of four if you count the summertime opportunities for families to opt into in-person learning. Not only did they abruptly announce there would only be one, they gave very short notice for that announcement and the timing for when the return date would be is uh, I believe in between Thanksgiving and, and the holidays. Uh, so it seems absolutely ludicrous to send kids into schools uh, possibly right after a, uh, a Thanksgiving that maybe should be longer, larger than it should be, but it's not our place to judge. Um, and certainly while uh, rates are still increasing. Uh, so if they recognizing that adjusting for these fluctuations in enrollment 
uh, in hybrid is, is a burden on schools. I'm on an SLT. I know how hard it is to, to juggle. It should at least be in spring when um, after some, after winter breaks, uh, but hopefully in addition, hopefully it would be an additional one. So this is simply saying the DOE should honor this commitment and not force parents into the position of making a decision now that says their children can never go back to school this year uh, if conditions change. And the final resolution, please tell us of, of that one. And so the final resolution is a, is a data request resolution, which we don't usually do through a resolution. But I think, you know, if I can editorialize for a minute, you know, I think that there's the sense that a lot of these decisions around high, about how to manage remote learning and hybrid learning feel political. It feels like it's about uh, being being able to say that we offered it, that the city offered it to everyone, as opposed to implementing it thoughtfully, prioritizing younger students or students with high needs that like we heard from a, a speaker earlier. And I think a lot of advocates, regardless of what they want to advocate for, are feeling that they are stymied and really getting doing advocacy effectively because the DOE has been so um, not transparent, but I don't have a word right now, uh, with, with real data. So this is not only just saying, hey, CEC2 wants this data so we can talk about our schools. It's saying this city needs this data so we can have a really informed conversation about how to do remote learning, about to hold the DOE accountable. Um, uh, we need to understand how enrollment's been affected, where our student, you know, it's, it's the, 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 the asks are in there and it's really the reason to do it in a resolution is to help to highlight how um, the DOE has really been hiding information from all of us. Great, thanks. Any questions on the resolutions uh, of Robin? Anyone? I, I would just like to add on that even if you file a freedom of information law request, as I'm sure Eric can attest to, uh, it take, it's the longest period of time out of any government agency. It, it's rejected several times uh, groundlessly. Um, they do not want to share any information because it displays how badly they're are failing our kids, but thank you. Okay. Yeah, I definitely want this to be about a routine information share. This isn't a one-time, give us an Excel spreadsheet. Yeah, I have a question about the um, third resolution about transparency on remote learning data because um, both in my kids' school and um, in other community school district two schools that, um, uh, have been, meet, you know, have been holding PTAs and meeting with parents. This information has been very forthcoming. I mean, we had a PTA meeting this morning and we have slides in my kids' elementary school and we have, um, you know, shared screens with all the data per grade of the students in remote, of the students in, uh, in blended and what the impact is on the register loss um, and what the plans are for changing of cohorts. So, and I just know, I mean, I've talked to, to parents who, you know, with Rocco Macri as their principal, with my kids' elementary school principal, like this information in community school districts will, to schools has been very forthcoming. So, you know, maybe in other settings, in high school settings or in other, in other school districts, it hasn't been forthcoming, but in, in community school district two, we've had this information, the principals have been very, very forthcoming with this information. So I'm, I'm perplexed as to why the resolution. Okay. Um, I know that there are other schools that that's not the case. And I also think there's merit to aggregated data. So it's not a matter of advocates having to track down PTA members at each school to try to put together a story about what's happening overall. And that, um, again, I think that there's, it, I think the D, that is lovely that the principals are doing that work for their communities, but the onus should be on the DOE should, to, be, to be taking that work off of principal's plates and sharing that with everybody, uh, sharing it with journalists. Um, and I think it's part of, I think there's a, 
we are a district two CEC, but we're also city, a lot of us do citywide advocacy and there's a citywide conversation about how to do remote learning. And I think all of us are strengthened by having aggregated access to what remote learning looks like across the city. So like, I know there's a school where, um, there are schools where you have kids opting into hybrid, but hybrid is really just sitting on a computer is essentially the school's functioning as a we work space, right? The kids aren't actually getting one-to-one -one live interaction with their teachers. The DOE should be providing information of how many students are in that are, are in that um, setup. And I know that it's not really common in elementary schools, but it is happening in some middle schools and I believe in some district two middle schools. But if you, you know, that that's why I think that this is a, a valid ask. Oh, hello. Um, but <laughs> obviously- Robin, Robin, towards what end? What are you proposing to do with um, the aggregated data that you, you, I'm not aware of any uh, middle schools in district two where that's happening, but- um, I am East Side Middle. Students go into East Side Middle and stare at screens instead of being taught by a teacher. And so, Wagner as well. And yeah. I believe Clinton as well. So, so I think that, it, and it's not even a judge. Look, I, and my school made this choice for my, at high school, I'm on the SLT. I have so much empathy for the situation the, the, the principals are in. It's not about pointing fingers at specific schools and saying you're doing it wrong. They're, they're, they're in a really hard position. So, it, but it's about being able to have an informed conversation. We had a parent tonight talk about the importance of getting kids in school every day. And I don't, I don't know how we effectively advocate for some of the, the some of the positions that either we have individually or that parents in our community have um, if we don't have the data. And the fact is a lot of these decisions are centralized and a lot of the inflexibility is coming from central. And so we need central to be giving us data. We need to look at citywide to see what's happening in order to make that case. And sometimes you don't know what you're looking for when you're asking for data. We know that there's displeasure about remote learning, but I feel like we're operating a little bit blind if we don't understand what decisions principals are having to make and wh where there's, if there's trends and where teachers are um, not being, you know, schools that are struggling with teachers that aren't coming in uh, that have medical exemptions. And, you know, there's, we don't know. We don't know what we don't know if we don't have the data in front of us. One important correction, so sorry to interrupt. I just, I just want us to caution, um, if we haven't actually been to a school and if we don't have a child who's enrolled in a school, and if we haven't personally walked in that school and verified with our own eyes what's happening there, it's inappropriate to make a statement about the school's blended learning model or instructional model or instructional so if we had yeah. like if you have questions data, about the instructional models that are operating, I'm going to continue speaking until until I'm done speaking and then I'll yield the floor. If if you have questions or concerns about the types of instructional programs or what's operating at this time or at any time within any of our of our middle school specifically, please don't name them um, due to hearsay. Please just ask. Um, and I'm happy to pursue community school district two data that I have access to, to share about which students have elected into blended learning and which have gone remote um, and, and any updates. Our principals have been incredibly forthcoming with and SLTs, PTAs, any involved parent, if you run into the parent, into the principal, even at arrival and dismissal, they are happy to tell you because it is in daily flux. It is a very stressful situation. Um, all of our principals are very, very forthcoming with this information. And so I think that if, if your child attends a school outside of community school district two, and you don't have this information, please contact that superintendent. I just really want to caution that, that as members of the CC speaking on behalf or representing what schools are doing is not a practice that we can 
meaningful forward and discussion about. So please, if you have a question, let me know because it's not accurate about the schools that were named. That is not accurate. Well, would publishing that data solve that problem? Yes, and the schools that, well, any of our schools have school reopening committees with principals and every members of every working title, along with an entire host of parents. Most of the school reopening committees in community school district two are more than 30 people and approximately half of them are comprised of parents. So all of that data is available for the school community specifically. And if you're doing larger citywide advocacy, then I encourage you to pursue that on the citywide level. And I'm happy to get the data for community school district two schools of which there are 49 and eight pre-K programs. Thank you. Great. So Great. wait, we're not doing, uh, during the second public session, members of the public can make comment, but during this time for discussion is for council members. I'd just like to answer, um, so the, the resolution is written, if I recall, doesn't specify anything in district two. Part of our advocacy, oh. not based just on our own experiences, but on, you know, we talk to families at schools. And as I said, very specifically, I, I'm in touch with principals. I'm on an SLT. I know how hard these decisions are. And it's not ever about indicting a school for the choices it was forced to make because of really unreasonable, sometimes like completely unnavigable parameters expo ex imposed on them from other forces. But in order to do the work, advocacy, whether it's citywide or with district two data, it has to be aggravated, ag aggregated. This resolution is not mutually exclusive to Donalda providing us with that. So I don't think anyone on this council would say no to that op offer to, to give us that. I know that I went on the, uh, I know DOE schools that doenyc.gov, whatever, their school directory. You can go to and see each school's plan, their London Learning Plan, and I went there. Some schools aren't up to date with changes. And I've also, again, it's very, it's a, quali it's a qualitative, um, it's qualitative narration about what the schools are doing. And I don't know anyone who has the bandwidth to sit and read qualitative, detail on at, whether it's in our own school district or citywide to do that kind of advocacy. So it's about asking the city, it's about drawing attention to the fact that the city is hiding this information from all of us, from journalists, and about um, being able to use it to advocate. And it's not about holding any individual school under a microscope and pointing fingers at any school or principal that is definitely in a crisis situation right now. Okay, great. Uh, now, uh, second public session. Do we have any speakers for the second public session? We do. So as I see it right now, we've got Noel Mahalo, Chen Kwok, and Kaushik Das, and I know that Jane Burke had signed up in the earlier session and I saw her earlier. So let's start with Noelle, because um, I see that she is here. So Noelle, please uh, unmute yourself. Thank you. I'm the parent of three district two students, two middle schoolers and one high schooler. I'm also the parent of a child with a secondary health condition and I have had open heart surgery myself. So COVID concerns are real for our family. Um, with COVID rates in New York City rising, Monday they were at 2.21%, yesterday it was at 2.8%, and the chancellor forcing families to make decisions on opting back into in-person learning by 11.15, coupled with potential school closings on the horizon with that 3% threshold, it feels like a chaotic scenario for families and school administrators. The current DOE attendance policy would enable families to opt in in this current period to keep their options open for the spring but continue to remote learn through the winter while the COVID rates are rising. 
this could be a disaster for schools who would have inflated numbers for in-person students who had no intention of, att in, of attending. How can we as parents possibly know what the landscape will look like in the spring when the pandemic shifts from day to day? It seems like that this is a disaster for administrators and for families. So hopefully this resolution that you're proposing will help to raise our voices about needing a spring opt-in. Thank you. Thank you, Noel. Um, next, I see Chen Kwok. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Yes, hi. Um, hi, my name is Chen Kwok. I'm a parent of two kids in uh, D2 schools, and I'm a PTA co-president at uh, PS111. I'm a member of PLACE. I'm a Brooklyn Tech graduate. The comments are my own. Um, two things. One is um, I want to call out Gino Tanakawa and Eric Goldberg for betraying the interests of District 2 families and students because they tried to sabotage the integration plan um, money awards for critical integration planning and education support that we all have been working on so hard for that everyone in the CC2 and others and the superintendent and her staff. And meanwhile, they've been saying on one side of their mouth, crying for integration and here we have it and they're trying to sabotage it, betraying us. They have betrayed and uh, uh, not held up to their oath of office of CC to represent us, so they should be removed immediately. Second point is uh, Shino Tanakawa has no more children in the public school system of New York City, neither in high school, in middle school, elementary. She should be removed immediately. Uh, I understand uh, Ms. Brewer, Brewer, President Brewer is on the call. I hope she hears us. Uh, I've written to her and I think other people have also. Uh, she no longer represents the families of District 2. She's incapable. She's already betrayed our interests. Uh, I called for her immediate removal as an appointee of uh, uh, Borough President Brewer. I re urgently request that you do that. Thank you very much. Okay, next we have Kaushik Das. I'm sorry, did you call me? We did. Hi. Sorry, uh, I will add on to Chen's comments. Uh, I, I know it's been addressed before. I'm sorry, I, I, I and not my, only myself remain disappointed that, uh, that Borough President and, um, and the Executive Superintendent did not compare to address the issues of last meeting. Uh, the legitimacy of, of one member affected the removal of a president, and in turn, that reflects the legitimacy of two elected officers this evening. The legitimacy of one, fact, of, one, of one member is not just something that's been brought up many times uh, for the grounds of not being a parent. On top of that, she refused to work with another, <coughs> with not more than one member uh, of the CEC, which is a requirement, and pushing her own definition of anti-racism. On top of that, as Jen pointed out, she lobbied against funding for, for our school district. If those are inexcusable. Anyone is inexcusable in and of itself. Altogether, it's damning. I question the self-serving, it also seems that Ed Irizarry and Emily Helpstrom uh, running for office and back of this seems uh, very self-serving when they voted against the last president. Uh, Ed, we've worked on some things in the past. I hope you are correct in that, that you continue to work for some of the things that you have in the past. Emily, however, I have, I'm sorry, we have very little faith. You say you bridge divides but you also say you bring voices not, not bubbling up to the top. Yes, you definitely do that. You do that at the expense of voices that, are, that come to you in these meetings and you and from your schools that you're obligated to represent. <laughs> it's very clear you, you all ignored the voices, 40, uh, 49 out of 50 speakers last meeting, you ignored the voices of my entire school where the SLT and the, and the PTA was united and unanimous, oh, I'm sorry, unanimous and a super majority in voicing their opinion. I've been coming to these meetings since March. Eric mentioned that Eric Goldberg at the time mentioned that many of these many schools come and talk and one week it's this thing and one Actually, week it's the please other. Please wrap it up. Please wrap it up. False. You've never had 49 of 50 people speak to the same issue. This speaks 
to our trust in yourself. We talk about the DOE, not- Please not wrap it up, Kaushik. Please wrap it up. Why do we have any trust in you? We don't. Okay. I am not able to see Taj Sutton in our attendee list. If you're here, please raise your hand. Otherwise, we will go on to Mar Fitzgerald. Hi. Um, I'm a District 2 public school parent. And I'd like to start by speaking in support of Shino Tanakawa. The sinister coordinated effort to discredit her, the incessant unfounded vile attacks on her character are motivated by the same racism and hate that has plagued this country. Shino has for years been a tireless advocate for public school students and parents in this city, particularly those left behind by the system. And we are incredibly lucky to have her here in District 2. I'd also like to speak in favor of the resolution for transparency on remote learning data. This information will be invaluable in truly assessing how this experience has affected our students and critical to being able to properly support them. Finally, I want to congratulate this council on its recent change in leadership. This is the first CC meeting I've attended in some time. Ed, Emily, I am confident that you will return this council to a safe space it once was, where all parents are able to actively participate in the policies that affect their kids the most. Thank you, I yield my time. Excellent, uh, Henry Half, you are next. I see you on this front page, so I know you're here. Hi, I'm Henry Half. I'm a parent of a first grader at PS11 in Chelsea. Um, I just wanna say that I am embarrassed by the level of um, entitlement of some of the uh, members of this council. Um, I think that as uh, Donalda Chumney said, um, it is inappropriate to make statements regarding the uh, transparency of the DOE with regard to remote learning. I think that we have, uh, we are not far enough along um, in our journey to determine the um, what has happened with, in relation to how has it, how has it affected our children um, in remote learning. I think that, you know, as our teachers have only just completed benchmark assessments for this year, it is really inappropriate to make statements like that. Um, also, in regard to a statement that was made by a parent regarding returning to in-person learning as soon as possible, um, I think that that is a rash and inappropriate statement. Um, we are far from the end of this pandemic. Um, and you are putting, by doing that, you would be putting parents and children of situ in situations where they have a multi-generational families at risk, as well as the staff in the schools at risk. Um, as a husband of a teacher, I think you would face an extreme, um, you, you would face uh, extreme opposition from the teachers union regarding any um, move to do that. Um, again, I just have to say again that I'm really, uh, I really find some of your uh, level of entitlement really inappropriate and that this is calling out Thomas and Robin. Um, it's just unacceptable. Excellent. Next we have Caliris Salas. And then I see Yorl Dean and Lilibeth have raised their hands. But first, let's go to Caliris. Hi. Caliris is fine, or Caliris en Espanol, um, either one. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, I don't know if some of you know me. I am the president of CEC4 in um, East Harlem. Um, I am here to speak. Uh, to say that I agree with your resolution in terms of extending or uh, providing another opportunity for um, uh, parents to choose whether they're going to go into blended learning. I think that right now is a critical time for our city in terms of where the pandemic is and the DOE made promises that they don't keep and it happens often. I also want to speak as somebody that um, just recently uh, became part of this CEC world and has consistently been advocating for integrated schools. Um, my son actually attends Central Park East One Elementary School um, in East Harlem, where we've had to fight um, in order to maintain the integrity of that school and its progressive practices, but also its intentionality in doing this work. 
And I want to say that one of the first people that I went to in order to get support for our school was Shino. And Shino has one of, is she's one of the people with the most character and integrity that I know. Um, I've, I've been attending these meetings um, because we all want to learn from each other. Um, and I really uh, want to echo some of the comments in terms of how some folks in this council, you really show your privilege and you really show your, your affluence. Um, and so I want you to keep in mind um, that there are some folks just a couple blocks from you that don't have your access and don't have your privilege and are fighting for children um, that really uh, don't have the resources that some of you have access to. And so I hope that we can work collectively to move our communities forward rather than um, pushing this narrative. And I wanna commend Chino for always standing up for our children, especially those that are most marginalized. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Um, next we have Yoral Dean Durandis. Uh, hi, good evening, um, everyone. I just um, wanted to be really quick in terms of like the resolutions. Um, um, I do think that uh, families should uh, may have at least uh, another option in terms of um, opting in for uh, remote learning. But I think uh, I would caution uh, members to also think about um, uh, from the planning perspective in terms of with teachers, um, and staffing at certain schools on if, uh, you know, that's something that would even be feasible um, for um, some, uh, from some school locations. It's just, um, you know, difficult to kind of have consistency across the board. Um, so I would just caution folks to uh, think about it from the uh, planning uh, side in terms of administration and the teaching side. Um, and in terms of, you um, um, in terms of the, uh, oh, getting my thoughts, sorry about that. But um, in terms of the, the questions about the um, remote learning and getting numbers on how many kids are enrolled and everything, I would also um, encourage uh, CEC members to uh, participate in some of the parents association meetings that happen um, regularly at schools because that information is readily available and is released by uh, principals, um, specific number breakdown by grades um, as well. So, I mean, that's, uh, you know, there's, that's a way that you can get that information without it necessarily being uh, released. And I mean, I'm not sure what you would do with the aggregated data anyway. It's just data that that's pretty dense and you're not really able to make too much sense of it. I would urge CEC members to just look at it from the other side as well, and then just sit in on some of these PA meetings where um, you won't necessarily need to make resolutions to get information that technically is readily available. Uh, thank you. Excellent. Um, our last speaker is Lilibeth Feliciano. And I just want to say thank you, Robin, for putting up the timer. And you get a lot more text messages than I do. <laughs> Lilibeth? Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Lilibeth Feliciano. I am part of PS51 Elias Howe. I have twin girls. Um, in fourth grade, I just wanted to come on <clears throat> one specifically to uh, show my support of Shino in my very recent years of being heavily involved. She's been very supportive and in true advocacy for our children. And at the end of the day, these platforms, we hope are surrounded by people for that purpose and that purpose alone. So um, in addition to that, I think this space should not only be a safe space, but should really be a space where we use it wisely to really give accountability to the DOE. As others have stated, the DOE has continually made promises and not lived up to those promises. And the accountability comes from us and these platforms. And so if we stay focused on that true purpose, I think we can do way more than spend time having conversations on things that honestly should not be at the forefront. To piggyback off of that, we need support for remote learning. We need support for blended learning. We need daily tech support for families who are struggling with just various simple tasks, but those simple tasks do not enable them to be able to effectively give the education to their child that they deserve. Um, so I think it's important that we focus on that. Aside from that, COVID, the pandemic is not over. I have now buried a fourth family member 
every time I get on these, I tell you guys about some tragedy in my life and I wish I could make it up, but I'm not. I'm on family member number four. And so accountability to the DOE specifically for COVID testing is not only crucial for your family while you're sitting there, the teachers, administrators, the children, seconds. All, all around. So please let's focus our efforts. Let's give accountability for COVID. Let's do our job. Let's focus on what's important. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Sorry for your loss. Um, Edward, that was the last of the public speakers. Great. Um, so now we're going to uh, move to the voting on the resolutions. I move that we vote on the first resolution, resolution in support of demanding immediate guidance on 2021 admissions process. I will second. Okay. Uh, so on the matter of the resolution uh, that was just referred to, I'm going to uh, read the names and please give your vote. Robin Broshi? Yes. Uh, okay. Um, I'm going to vote yes. Uh, Vincent Hom. Uh, Eric Goldberg? Yes. Emily Halstrom? Yes. Uh, Edward Irizari? Yes. Maud Marin? Yes. Uh, ben Benjamin Morden? Yes. Ushman Neal? Yes. Leonard Silverman? Yes. Uh, Shino Tanakawa? Yes. Yes. That was Tom, right? Okay. Yeah. That, that resolution is passed 11 to 0. Okay. Uh, so, do we have a motion for the next resolution? On motion for the next resolution. Uh, that's in support of additional opportunities for families to opt into in person learning. Yes, I move. I move that we vote on that resolution. Second. I, can I just ask that that you rephrase that motion? Sorry about that. Um, to say that you vote yes on it because you're really voting on voting on a motion rather than a yay or a nay. So, so you, I, I move to approve the resolution. Thank you, Eric. Okay. I second. Okay. I'm gonna call the names again. Uh, Robin Broshi, how do you vote? Yes. Uh, I vote uh, yes. Vincent votes yes for this resolution. Um, Eric Goldberg, how yes. do you vote? Yes. Okay. Uh, Emily Halstrom. Yes. Uh, Edward Irizari. Yes. Maud Marin. Yes. Benjamin Morden. Yes. Neil? Yes. Leonard Silverman? Yes. Shino Tanakawa? Yes. And yes. Tom votes yes. Okay. Um, do we have a motion to approve the third resolution? Um, resolution in yeah. support of demanding transparency on remote learning data. I move yeah, to approve. I Second. Okay. Uh, Robin, how do you vote? Yes. Okay. Um, I abstain on this uh, resolution. Uh, Eric, how do you vote? Yes. Emily? Yes. Edward? Yes. Maud? No. Oh. I'm sorry, uh, that was a no? That was a no. Okay. Uh, Benjamin? Yes. Ben? Okay, uh, we'll go back to him. Uh, Ushma? No, Ben voted yes. Oh, he did? All right, yes. I can hear him. Okay. I also vote yes. 
Okay. Um, Len Silverman. Abstain. Uh, Shino. Yes. Yes. Okay. So that motion is passed with uh, let's see, eight yeses, two abstains, and one no. Or sorry, eight yeses, yeses, two um, one no, and two abstentions. Okay, I move that we recess until nine oh five. I have to go to the bathroom. Second. <laughs> okay. Oh. Nine oh five. Are we not addressing the bylaws that are on the agenda? Uh, that is not on the agenda. No. Oh, I'm looking at the October agenda. Okay. Okay. So uh, we'll be back. We're adjourning. Adjourn. Yeah. Okay, adjourning. Eight fifty-seven. Okay. So we will be back at 9.05. So we're straight into the business meeting now, right? When we get back? Yes. Okay. We're just taking a moment to powder our noses. Got it. Thank you.
Okay, call to order. Vincent, can you call the roll, please? Okay. Is everyone back? Yeah, we're all back. Um, so um, I'm going to call the roll now. It's uh, Robin Broshi. Here. Okay. Um, I am here. <laughs> Eric Goldberg. Oh, I see you. Sorry. Uh, Emily Halstrom. I see you. Got you. Yep, thank you. Ed, I also see you. Maud Marin. Yep, she's there. Okay, got you. Benjamin Morden, I see you. Uh, Ushmaneel? I'm here. I see you, okay. Uh, Len Silverman, I see you. President and accounted for. <laughs> Uh, Shino Tanaka. I'm here. I see you. Okay. Here. And uh, Tom Rockledge. Here. Can you hear me? I got you. Okay. Uh, all 11 members have returned for the working business meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vincent. A new business. I am appointing Thomas Rockledge, the uh, co-chair of the Students in Temporary Housing, along with Ushma Neal, should they uh, choose to accept the uh, designation chairpersons, co-chairpersons of that committee. Is that okay? to work with Tom on this. Tom? Yeah, great. Thank you. Okay. All right, having said that, is there any other new business? Can I just give a little bit of information that I heard about coronavirus vaccines and the rollout of them? Great. I think the first thing to keep in mind is that on the chart of the, um, I believe six current vaccines that are in phase three trials, those trials are all for people 18 years and older. Nothing is currently being tested in any kind of a pediatric population. So I think that's something that's very important for everyone to keep in mind in terms of return to school um, and what that's going to look like. That's point one. Point two is that I have seen what the vaccine distribution phasing plan looks like. Phase one is the jumpstart phase for high-risk workers in healthcare facilities and first responders. Phase 1B is for people of all ages with underlying conditions that put them at higher risk and older adults living in nursing homes. Then phase two um, is critical risk workers and essential workers, um, but then that also includes teachers and school staff. Um, and older adults that are not in phase one and people in homeless shelters or group homes and individuals with physical or mental disabilities. Phase three is young adults um, and other people. And then phase four is everyone else. So just wanted to give that bit of insight so that everyone feels a little bit, uh, um, a little bit more in the know about what's happening. The last I heard, um, Pfizer is applying for the emergency use authorization. I think those people in phase one might, might start to get those within eight weeks, six to eight weeks. Um, so I don't think that it's realistic to think about um, herd immunity and full vaccination. And this is just one vaccine out of six. The entire globe will be on the hunt for these vaccines. I know that the US government has already offered them nearly $2 billion for the first billion or the first um, 100 million doses. We shall see where that goes. Hey, um, Ushma, um, you mentioned that phase two would be essential uh, workers and people in shelter, uh, but that doesn't include uh, families with children under 18, right? 
I don't, unless one of them has a comorbidity, um, but remember these, these vaccines are not for children. Right. So, so there, anyone under 18 would not be eligible to get it. Would there, if there was somebody with a disability or somebody who was in a high risk group who was in that family, they might, that adult might be able to get it. Okay. Just wanted to keep everybody up to date. If you know, if the more that I hear, the more we can all you know feed it forward into both personal as well as other decisions that we talk to our liaison schools about. Thank you very much, Ushma. Thank you. I also uh, want to announce that I'm appointing Shino as the chairperson of the diversity committee. Having said that. Um, I have some more new business before we move on, if you don't mind. Uh, during our meetings, uh, we have a, another Community Education Council president coming on our meetings, uh, spreading lies. And during her meetings, we are not allowed to speak. Um, so I was wondering if we could address that as a group, how to handle something like that. Um, the same woman also cost me a promotion at my job. Uh, okay, well, well, Tom, you know, no one is allowed to um, lob personal assaults and, um, you know, slander or aspersions. And if you believe that's happening, then I will expel that uh, person from the meeting, moot that person from the meeting. And if anyone has a problem with that, they can appeal the chair's decision. Okay, so that's how we're going to handle that. Okay, well, that goes for everyone. Okay. All right, so now we're gonna talk about preparations for the upcoming Chancellor's Town Hall on December 8th. Um, I will defer to Robin and, and some of the more experienced uh, council members uh, to begin discussing this. And on the issue of new business, I had a few things that I wanted to raise. Fine, fine. Go right ahead. So there were two, um, concerns that I wanted to raise. One was, um, are we going to have the bylaws, uh, the revised bylaws, the, the bylaws committee met over the summer? Myself, Eric Goldberg, Shino, and Len and Eric for some of the, Len and um, Vincent for some of the meetings and prepared bylaws, which were twice on our um, calendar. And because we know that some parts of our existing bylaws were no longer valid, we need to have updated bylaws. And so are we going to um, put forth those bylaws again? Are you going to appoint, is there some issue with, is there some reason why they weren't on the agenda this time, Ed? And if so, can you articulate what that is so that we can move forward with those bylaws? Well, to be frank, I, I haven't had an opportunity to read the proposed new bylaws, um, and I haven't, uh, I, I understand that there are a number of changes. Um, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't at the meeting, the bylaws um, uh, meeting, uh, the committee meeting, and I'd like to have everyone, because we have bylaws that date back to 2013, I believe, and before we uh, change them, I'd like everyone to read them thoroughly uh, and, and then place them on the agenda and discuss them um, in detail. So I, I don't think we were prepared to do that tonight. And um, I think uh, it would have just been too much for this first meeting, but I'm happy to put, put them on the agenda for the upcoming, um, the upcoming meeting, uh, unless anyone else objects. I, I just have a question. Having another, oh, go ahead, Tom. Yes, Tom. I, I, was, I was just going to ask what, what makes our, our uh, bylaws right now invalid? I just, when I read the proposals, I, I, I didn't see anything that made it invalid per se under New York corporate law, which I guess we'd be under. So, I mean, what exactly makes our bylaws invalid? The bylaws aren't invalid, but there was a section of our bylaws specifically dealing with absences that when uh, there was an issue that came up in the last term with uh, removing someone for a number of absences and the DOE legal department said that um, that provision of our bylaws was not enforceable because it didn't distinguish between um, excused or unexcused absences in that. By so based on that, uh, that portion which needed to be updated in order to be enforceable. We, if you recall, at the beginning of the term, created a bylaws committee. You were on it, Tom. 
uh, and um, decided to update our bylaws. There were things that were not that we needed to address, not because the, there was an invalid section, but because they weren't modernized to deal with Zoom meetings and issues like muting and unmuting or ejecting people from Zoom meetings. Plus, we harmonized the bylaws with the um, DOE proposed bylaws, uh, the model bylaws, rather, I should say. Um, and just speaking of bylaws, for instance, if we were following the bylaws when committee chairs are appointed, um, our current bylaws, Article 5, say that the president appoints them with the approval of the council. So as we did previously, the council votes on those um, committee chairs, if we were going to follow the bylaws. Oh, well, that's not how we did it previously with some chairs, just currently. So, um, but uh, I would also say, I wouldn't the New York State uh, Department of Education, rather than the city, uh, be the ones to go to to opine on the validity of any of our sections, since we are a state chartered organization, not a city chartered organization? The model bylaws that we have and that we reviewed this summer at our publicly noticed meetings were from New York City DOE. Yeah, so. Uh, to think about. Okay, so now discussion on the preparations for the upcoming, unless you have anything else, Maude. Um, I'm sorry, I just wanted to jump in there and say, you know, I remember that they were on our, our agenda and that I, I just didn't remember that we discussed them. So if we're, if, if they're going to be on the agenda, are we going to have a chance to discuss them out of committee or? I think it would make sense to have another bylaw committee meeting that everyone on the CEC and everyone in the public is clear that this is going to be the meeting. It's not a, it's a, it's a working meeting, but it's a working meeting to kind of reach an informal consensus that everybody is pleased with that product. So that when we present it at a calendar meeting, we're presenting what the council has agreed on. Maybe the public has some comments that um, we hadn't thought of and we could vote to amend them there. And then we vote at for, and then that would be where we present it at a calendar meeting. And then we would vote at it, vote for it at the subsequent calendar meeting. Because I agree with you, Emily, it's, it's a lot to discuss at at the, um, it's a lot to discuss at the, at a general meeting. Yeah, at a working business meeting. A little um, <laughs> obscure, but I also think there should be kind of an internal understanding when there's going to be a bylaw committee meeting that's not just the kind of hashing out part, but that it's like, okay, this is what we want to really all feel like there's a consensus on, so we don't have to have a long argument or discussion at a calendar meeting. I mean, that makes sense to me because I, I know that it sort of came up and there's there's lots of like these little, little tiny things that I really did have questions on. And then it was at this sort of big meeting where there was resolutions and public things and it was already dragging till 11 o'clock. And so I do think we need to have some type of separate meeting. And, and or, or perhaps, I mean, is it legal to have it in the, working business meeting um yes but and so it could be we could do a spot we could do a committee meeting or we could do a um, special working business or a meeting. special working business meeting Great. and i think functionally it's not that different and i had a second issue that i wanted to raise in new business um but just so it's clear we did have two committee bylaw meetings that were open to the public and obviously any committee member could have come and discussed any issue they each lasted about two hours over the summer and members of the public did attend and so there was certainly room for uh discussion at that time uh from any council member who had a concern or an issue uh but moving on to my second issue of new business um as Ushma pointed out, there were folks today who had signed up for the public speaking, but who were not in the meeting. Um, and I was surprised to see that we had instituted a, you must register for a CEC meeting without any discussion of that in a public meeting amongst council members. So it concerns me that we've set up barriers for attendance to CEC meetings, one without any discussion among council members, and two in a way that might well have um, excluded people from participating in the meeting. 
I'm sorry, I don't understand. Uh, it, what it, people just had to register and that's blocking them? You're saying? I mean, I, I did it myself. I just went in and put my name in and my email address and it let me right in. Well, is that a, a barrier to entry that you're uncomfortable with? I was pointing out that there were people who signed up for public speaking, uh, but who uh, were not here in, in greater numbers than has happened before. And that we didn't as a council discuss whether or not we were requiring pre-registration. But you could have registered at the moment you went in, right? So you're saying that putting the name in, your name, your first name, your last name, and your email address is- I, I said what I'm saying, Tom, I made it. I, 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 I think that's a concern. fair point that it wasn't that we didn't talk about it beforehand. So let's talk about it now going uh, for, for going forward, whether we want to stick to that model. I think it's a good model. I, I think that, you know, it, like like Tom says, there's really not much work in just putting in your name and your email. And it, and it makes people sort of accountable. Uh, you know, uh, we, we can understand who is coming and uh and, and it's not a big deal i don't think it's a problem i know a lot of ptas are doing it president council did it and also this was, was recommended by some of those cyber people in my work not in this cec sphere but this is the one of the ways to minimize zoom bombing because people have to give their full name and email address, they can do fake ones, but still that extra step actually does reduce the likelihood of people misbehaving within the space. So it's been recommended that we do this. It was my understanding that PTAs and SLTs were doing it when they were voting because they needed to comply with making sure that people were, uh, you know, uh, that there was one person, one vote was my understanding on that. Okay, so now we have a discussion on the preparations for the upcoming Chancellor's Town Hall on December 8th. Anyone have any views on this? I thought maybe if Michelle Chang is paying attention, Michelle, are you here? If you could um, unmute and maybe talk a little bit about what some of the other CECs have done, since even though a bunch of us have done town halls before none of us have done it in zoom so we could just not that we have to do what other councils do but just to get yeah. a little bit of a yeah absolutely um so i sent out to the cec i believe so i'm running several um of, like helping out with several of these town halls but i think i sent out this morning perhaps to cec to um translated flyers um, for a Spanish, and we're gonna have both Mandarin and Cantonese trans, uh, interpretation. So it just comes out as like Chinese translation as well as like the registration link is live. Um, and that's not a registration link where like someone necessarily needs to like pre-register there's any barriers. It's just like any Zoom meeting, there's just that registration set up so that there isn't any Zoom bombing. Um, so what I've been seeing from other CECs is um, just like a marketing of those flyers in advance and what people can do is on that registration link you can take uh questions and um like we can on like the face end either randomize like parent questions or if the cc separately wants to uh collect their own questions then we can do that as well. So I've seen some councils just go with the randomized, some ask parents on their own and have like their own list. I mean, either way, that's very easy to accommodate. And um, I believe I mentioned like next Friday, if some council members are free, we can just like go through um, like the technical video conferencing with Learning Times, which is our video vendor. But it's, we try to like simulate as much as possible an in-person town hall. So the format's pretty similar where usually the council members will ask questions first. Um, and then like there's some sort of either random or pre-planned like questions from the public, depending on whatever you would like. So is there any way we can impose a time limit on uh, the chancellor's speaking? Because he tends to just keep on talking to avoid questions, answering questions. It seems to be a pattern. 
I have seen some other CECs just say like, you know, we have like this many questions, like we'd really like to get through all of them. So like, if you don't mind like keeping your responses to like whatever time. Um, I've just say that, yeah. That's Did it work, good, Michelle? That, that sounds like a good way. Um, I think, yeah, there was, for another CEC, I, he went, he got through, I would say at least 20 questions, so. Oh. In an hour? No. Yeah. Did he answer any of those 20 questions? Yeah, yeah. So like uh -huh. he answered those all. Well, I will say it was more than an hour. I think he stayed on for an extra 15 minutes to get everyone, but there were 20 questions answered. Okay. I wonder, you know, if, if people are giving comments, I, I know a lot of people give, you know, they didn't really ask a question. They give a comment, which I, I totally think is fine. I just wonder I mean, what do people like limit themselves? Do we do a minute? Do we do 30 seconds? Like if it seems as though, I mean, it's like, you don't want to stifle free speech, but when there's like the same, 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 and we don't actually get a question that he could actually answer. Well, have we discussed whether or not we're allowing questions from the audience from the five or if we're soliciting them in advance? Yeah, well, I think we have to do it in advance, right? And and Michelle, when when he answered twenty questions, were they sent to him in advance? Do you know that? And um, Ellen, Emily, I'm sorry, I like, cut you off no, without no, getting. No. I was thinking questions. in live. I was thinking of the, Carmen Ferenia when she did it, and it was like people came up to the mic. So I was just thinking about that. Yeah. And I would definitely not share questions ahead of time. That's a bad idea. We got to put him on the spot. Great. Um, so the specific CEC I'm thinking about, like the one that got through all the questions, I think that's a big goal is just to get through as many questions as possible. They did a mix of, um, they gathered questions from the community and those they did send it in advance to the chancellor um, and just trying to cover like all the main topics. And then with the leftover time, then they did the randomized questions from the signups. Okay. I mean, he should know how to do his job, right? So he shouldn't have a problem answering the questions. Yeah. I'm not going to ask anything that he shouldn't know. And I didn't mean that, Tom. I meant just more of like comment, comment, comment of same, same. That's all. I, I, I understand that. Yeah. But I mean, if we field it in advance, right, we'll eliminate that. I mean, we could definitely say some of the comments, right? I think that's fair. I mean, I'd like to aggregate the 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 comments and, and slash questions from that December 3rd event. I mean, just because sometimes people don't want to sit there and listen to sort of a dog and pony show. I mean, some people do, but I just do think that that could really, you know, bring up some good juicy stuff that we can certainly submit by writing. So just to offer the way we've done it in the past in in-person situations, we used to put together questions as the council, the 11 of us put together a document, come up with a set of questions, not too many, and then we send those to him ahead of time and the chancellor can come and make a very brief, you know, we usually ask him to just address CECD2 council questions in five to 10 minutes. And then we open up to families in D2. I think we should have more than five to 10 minutes. I mean, that's less than a minute each, right? And I think we should be able to follow up when he doesn't answer the question with a brief, 15 second, hey, answer the question. You know, he, all he does is, you know, meander in his statement. Yeah, we have to be able to keep him on track or he's just going to do it the entire time. I don't know, that's my opinion. But. We had gone through some amount of discussion when we were going to be hosting this back in March, didn't we? That we were gonna come up with a set of like six or seven questions that maybe just one person from the council was going to take the lead on asking. And then we were gonna ask people in advance to fill out a piece of paper and there'd be a couple of us screening those and figuring out like what bucket they fill in. Like, am I remembering this correctly? That yes. we solicited everything in advance and at that time, or we were going to solicit things at the beginning of the meeting and be able to choose very specifically. I mean. We have the advantage of being able to do that electronically right now, where we could then correspond with someone in advance and say, we would like you to be present to ask your question as you have posed it here. And we're going to have to trust a little bit that people are going to 
say what they said they they asked in advance um, or we could say we're going to ask your question if you would like to be there yeah for the sense of uh efficiency maybe the latter would be the better option we're going to ask your question as written i mean if we could say like you know eric goldberg wrote in and has a child at ps xyz and had this question for you I mean, that's one way of getting around. That cuts, um, down, that cuts down on some of the like uh, moment of like re repeat, repeat, repeat. Transition, yeah. Right. And then in that regard, we would have an opportunity to screen all of them and make sure we were figuring out what are the most salient questions that our community is asking. Like if we get a hundred questions about you know, reopening schools will pick whichever one is phrased correctly and, you know, be able that could both guide what we all choose as as questions we ask, given that they would be reflective of our parent community, as well as, you know, picking out some other specific ones that we we could figure out. Sure, but I also want the opportunity to ask my own questions to him directly and to briefly follow up when he doesn't answer them. Right. I get it. And I certainly don't want to take away anybody's control. It's a matter of, of figuring out how many questions we ask from the community versus ourselves. Sure. I mean, yeah. maybe limit it to one or two questions to each council member if they choose to ask it, something like that. I don't know if we come to an agreement on that. Or a temporal component of it. I, however you want to do it, it's fine with me. I just think we should each have the opportunity to directly address the chancellor. And that's 11, yeah. that's 11. I mean, if we all had access to some sort of a spreadsheet, you know, like we do for the speak, the public speaking, like, you know, if we put up a Google form that then we also that we circulated through Yvette and constant contact to the families in D2 to pose their question with their name, their email, what school they're in, so that we can you know verify that it's a D2 school. Um, and then all of us as council members would be able to go through that. And I don't know whether we're voting for our favorites or picking out the ones that we want to make sure are asked. Um, what I recall from this spring was that we had all kind of agreed to coalesce on a couple of different issues. Obviously, none of them had to do with the circumstances that we're facing right now. Um, that doesn't mean that they are no longer relevant to ask. Um, I mean, so to the issue of like council members asking questions and there's 11 of us, I wonder if there's that many different questions among the 11 of us. And if, you know, either someone, I mean, Tom has like something he really wants to put forward um, and some of us might not really find it necessary to, to put forward something. So like maybe just naturally we would self sort into a smaller number or we could do like an internal spreadsheet of questions. And then I see like, oh wait, Ushma's just got a great question that I would have asked. That was my question. So, and I, you know, Ushma can ask it or whatever. And it may be that even though there's 11 of us, there's only like three topics and then only three of us go. Yeah, I, I prefer not to put my question down on paper. I just want to ask them. During. Well, we, we know. And I wasn't trying to, I wasn't trying to make you show your cards and no one is forced to participate. Okay. Um, and it was, so it was just an idea. Uh, it's not a bad one. I just don't want to give them any heads up. <laughs> but would you give the rest of us the heads up about the nature of what it is you want to ask him about? It will definitely involve him resigning. Uh, <laughs> so, and I don't, nobody else would really feel comfortable asking it, but I feel very comfortable. So wouldn't that be a, a problem with the, um, the policy that Ed just talked about and that you complained about earlier, being attacked by someone from the outside? It's similar. That's about his job. And uh, I mean, if we, we can't criticize someone, we can't ask uh, why he said that he wouldn't close school despite the letter that we wrote uh, un unless 108,000 epidemiologists signed off on it and people died, and I can't ask that question, 
that's not fair? I think that's fair. That's the question I'm going to ask. Question? I'm going to ask him about mariachi music. I'm not saying you can't ask legitimate questions, but I guess we're, we're going back to some of the things we, uh, we wanted to avoid. Avoid, you know, this uh, antagonism, and I think overt antagonism. I will say, uh, I don't know if that's necessary. What you plan to do? Well, I mean, the community is outraged with him. I mean, if you talk to anybody in the district, nobody is happy with either himself or the mayor. So I feel like I would be not doing my job if I didn't ask him if he thought maybe he handled this poorly and maybe somebody else would be better to fill his role right now. Well, Tom, you're a good lawyer. You know, you can pose questions like on cross-examination. You can ask about, well, how do you feel uh, you handled, uh, you know, the, the closing issue and COVID and, and, and ask him yes or no. I mean, you can do that and get to the substance without, you know, asking him to resign. I mean, just go yeah, through. I do. You don't but have to do not. that. Just just ask about the substance of, 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 you know, your problems with his administration. You can do that. Sure, I will. Thank you. I see Len has a hand up. Okay, yeah, she I, just came through with the uh, Google link from um, when we first started discussing this. Sorry, Len. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm just very concerned with uh, anything that appears to reek of censorship. Uh, and, and I understand what the concerns are. I know there are strong opinions one way or the other. I understand Tom's point as well. But I think if someone wants to make a comment, you know, we shouldn't be concerned whether or not it might be viewed as being antagonistic. We are not, I don't think our, we serve a purpose necessarily to be antagonistic, but we do serve a role in requiring accountability for the parents in our district. And uh, other than ma maintaining norms of common decency, I really don't think there should be any censorship on what anyone chooses to ask uh, or how they choose to ask it. Obviously, I, I mean, no one's gonna ask, you know, how many times do you beat your wife? I mean, obviously, I think that might be a question that I think we'd all have a problem with. But I think with regard to, you know, legitimate questions or if somebody really is that angry enough and wants to ask someone to resign, I think that's fair game. But I, I'm concerned when we start imposing censorship on people and limiting rights of free speech under the rubric of, say, of, of saying it, uh, we don't want to be antagonistic. I, I, I think some people may want to be antagonistic. Others don't. Look, I, I speak to the chancellor on a monthly basis, or I usually get to ask a question. It's sometimes it's um, it, it's a little pointed, but it, it's done in a friendly way. Um, so I, I'm I'm concerned again with uh, any any way to any attempt to pre-censor questions. So Len, um, I didn't intend for that to come out as a censorship concern, and I think Edward uh, got to the point of saying there are ways to ask the question to get the answer you want. Uh, or not get the answer you want uh, without being, uh, without crossing a line. And, and that was my only concern there, not to censor any question that might come out, but to do it in a respectful way. Also, just because I feel like if, if, it's, if, if he feels on the attack where it's disrespectful, and then he leaves, then actually we, the result is, is that a lot of other questions don't get answered either. Yeah, so I've been at events where he's left because yeah. I, mean, I am in no way suggesting that we should uh, do anything like, and that happens to be like people screaming on individual issues. <laughs> I mean, I, I'll be hard on my questions, but I, I think I'd be respectful of what I'm my point across. So, so, where, so where do we stand? It sounds like we had this first question of how much time do we give to the council versus the public? And then what's the format of the questions for both council members and the public? So I think those are kind of the questions that we just got to answer. And then. <clears throat> and it's a tricky balance. Go with that. We have the knowledge to ask, I think, you know, to, to me, possibly get past the first layer of obfuscation that might happen. But 
we also um, want parents in our community to feel like we've given them the floor. And to the extent that this is a bit of a dog and pony show and the chancellor's in the end gonna say what he wants to say, there's a lot to be said for being perceived as a council that you know is putting its families you know, toward the front of the line to have access. And I'm so not- Can we say 20 minutes for council, 40 minutes for the public and start with that as a work? Can, can I just, can I just chime in? Um, I'm not, I'm concerned with time limits because I, I know from seeing the chance on a regular basis, he could spend 20 minutes answering the one question. I think yeah. mm -hmm. that was an issue that came up. I, I think in fairness, I think each council member should have the option. I'm not saying everyone's gonna exercise it, but to ask a question and perhaps a follow up because I remember I asked a question once and his answer was no. And that was it, you know, so it, was a, it was a question that everybody really wanted to know the answer to and he just said, uh, and, and, and people were like, oh my God, you know. Well, you like, got an answer. So, so I got an answer, but it, you know, I, I, I would have liked to, you know, I think I did follow up, but it, it, you know, follow up was kind of appropriate when you get a yes or no answer. So I just think in all fairness, uh, I think we are representatives of specific constituencies. I think we should certainly make a concerted effort not to be redundant, that we that if we do come up with our questions, we should at least discuss with one another what areas we're gonna be discussing so we don't all ask the same question. Well, I think, I, I feel like okay. tacking onto that, Len, I feel like um, if we do put it out there in advance for people to ask questions, that's always helpful because then we can sort of synthesize a little bit because the, the um, link that Ushma pointed out that Sheena put in the, um, the email to us actually has some really good questions that we've already spent some time on. And if we ask people um, to, to submit questions in advance and we see that there's overlap, then we're gonna get our question asked but we also look like we're giving it to parents if we, you know, pick out a parent possibly. I mean, that's one way of starting at least. Could we do it like uh, an allotment of time for a council member just for our half of it? Like, do you ever see the uh, Senate Judiciary uh, hearings where, you know, the senators actually have the right to stop uh, the nominee from speaking uh, just so they can't uh, meander in their statements? I think, I, I think that's a little overboard, but I will say, I like what they did in the presidential debate where you'd go through different topics so we could have, I'm not saying cutting anybody off, but you have, let's say, you know, the council agrees that three of us ask topics in one area, three of us might ask topics in another area, three of us might topics in another area. I don't know if we could cover enough areas where we each have disagreements or things that we're interested in in, those, in enough areas, but maybe that's a way to spread it out so at least the basics are covered and then the parents can follow up and on that. Can, can we shoot for a plan by a certain date, maybe like the end of November, November 25th, let's, let's have a plan in place uh, so that, you know, we know what we're doing going in. I think it's also wise if we're going to solicit questions from parents to do that as soon as possible to give them a few weeks and then to give us a little bit of time to review what it is that is submitted. But we have the meeting with FACE next Friday, right? So shouldn't we kind of have a plan before we go into the meeting with FACE? Yes. Wait, the meeting is next Friday though, right? Not this yeah, Friday. Friday? Friday? The 20th. 20th, right. So we have a week and a okay, half. Can I, can I also just say this isn't, you know, no, you're not going to get answers to the questions that, that we, we this is really a venting session. This, the, this is serving a purpose for the community to vent, you know, one way or another, their frustrations, their their approval, whatever, you know, they might be on the other side, whatever it is. But that's really what it is. It's not so much to really, I, I, I think the actual information you're gonna get out of this is not gonna be fantastic, but I think the opportunity for FaceTime to really express anger, frustration, yeah. whatever it is. I know, Eric, we agree on this whole, you know, people being forced to go into remote, you know, there's issues that we agree on, I mean, I think that's and, what and this say, is also like I, I just looked at, at the questions in the links and Vincent wrote such a, an interesting question about um, um, parent teacher conferences that I feel like you know we, we've never even discussed and I feel like oh my gosh what a fascinating topic I have lots of I would love to hear what the you know the thoughts are on that so I feel like there are also things that people even from the audience I turned, bring I turned up. the video off. 
fine. We're basically done. We're just Eric, you can where you're on mute and not on mute. Go ahead, Emma. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead, Emma. <laughs> no, it was just just like I feel like that there are some really interesting areas of discussion that um a parents might have that we that are surprising and that are good questions that he might actually answer. But yes, Len, I agree with you. When I, I went in to um, the one with Carmen Ferreña thinking one, like thinking it was gonna be this like, oh my gosh, we're gonna get so many interesting things. And it was not <laughs> at all. I was really annoyed. Well, let's try to have before. it both ways. Okay. Let's try to have it both ways. Get information and let parents vent. And so let's have the time. What's the action item we want to take out from tonight about this? I think we should create a Google form to ask parents to submit questions, right? Regardless of how we're going to run the town hall, this, this would be a good thing to have anyway. And Maybe there needs then, to be a disclaimer on it saying that we anticipate large number of questions, so don't be upset if your question is not asked. Right. It doesn't mean you're going to get to ask them. Yeah. Okay. That sounds yeah. good. I can... I can work with and then that. should we as a council? Yeah, I think we should start oh. with looking at what we put together in March. There are probably some questions that are still relevant that we may want to elevate. And we can yeah. certainly but add. It sounds like the. Go ahead. No, no, sorry, I was jumping in. That's OK, I was done. How about this? <laughs> We have 11 council members. Each council member gets five minutes. We'll coordinate. We could ask a question from the group or we could ask our own question. We'll throw them up there on a spreadsheet so we all see what's going on, what area we're covering. And then you just do what you want. You want to ask questions from the community that you like? Go ahead. If you don't, don't. Coordinate to a certain um, extent in advance such that, you know, I don't fall in love with questions. And if I'm the 11th person to go, that everybody else has already asked and that we as a group haven't figured out like the things that we we're never going to agree on, you know, not everybody's going to agree on what the most important questions are going to be. So I do agree with an element of subjectivity of everybody gets to have a certain say in what questions are going to be asked. But I have a feeling I'm probably personally not going to come up with anything original that our parent community isn't already going to come up with. And I'd really like to see the, um, the volume that comes in about certain issues. And that's probably going to reflect the things that I would want to see him respond to whether or not it's satisfying. Let's get like a, an email out as soon as possible with a form that will promote a few times. We'll target it at parent coordinators, make sure they're also sending them out directly to their communities. So it's not just our mailing list. Um, we'll see yeah, what like from DLT, you know, SLTs and, you know, yeah. we'll see what comes in. No one will have Tom's question. And then, so he still gets his spot. And then we'll see if there's like, if we feel there's a huge gap, one of us can fill in the gap with where we see it. Um, and then maybe the, the balance is parent questions. And we just have to have a mechanism for how we screen the submissions and regroup on prioritizing them. I feel like- And one thing I'd add is, I think what Tom had said previously, like there's a way that that could work where like each of us kind of choose it, like we get all the parent questions, we obviously have some of ours and we come up with like some subset that each of us is like, okay, I wanna ask one of my questions and two of these other questions and that that's you know if if we're if we're not going to have the public ask the question directly and i don't know if we decided that um then we're going to be reading the questions anyway so i mean maybe we could work around that idea of, yeah that's a great idea you know you, you're required to come up with your own and to take some of the public yeah that you think are important that's just, that's so smart i, th I think Okay, so I can, um, by tomorrow, I'm going to mock up a, a form and I'll share it with everyone to make sure we all sign off on the language. And then um, I'll ask 
ask a vet to use constant contact to to reach out to um, to send it to our list, and then also uh, we can do our own personal outreach to our our schools and um, and see see how the onslaught of submissions that comes in. And I'll set up the form so that any of us can log in and see what's what's been submitted. So I want to throw a monkey wrench in here a little bit, no, which I think no, we no. might we might be able to come up with a resolution on. Um, how do we manage people who are whose primary language is not English? Yeah. We could translate Google Forms and put them out there, and then share. The, the spreadsheet from the, the Fed by the Google form with the chancellor's office. But if we can figure out a way, we're gonna have interpreters anyway. It would be nice if we could have one or two non-English speakers actually have a direct opportunity to ask a question to the chancellor through interpreters. That's so smart too. Um, I mean- I, I don't know why we would make exceptions. Right, do that. Sorry, Tom, I was talking over you. Can you repeat yourself? I was just saying, I mean, that's a good idea. If that's how you choose to use, like say your question to give it to a translator, why you should be able to do that, right? We just have to make sure our form is available in, in other languages. Right, yeah. and the answers, I mean, I won't be able to read any of the answers. I wouldn't know which questions to pick. Google Translate, it's really easy. So our current, like the speaker sign up is in English and Chinese. Um, nobody has ever put in a reply in Chinese. So I've never had to try to, to translate that. But I think there's the, the first decision that we need to make, which is, are we allowing speakers who are not on our council to be the ones asking those questions? Because well, I don't know that we should make a special exception for someone mm -hmm. just because they are a non-English speaker. I do totally agree with the idea that we should be asking questions from different kinds of communities. Right. So we'd have the translator ask a question, not the person themselves. So we would avoid that uh, privilege of, uh, you know. Yeah, we, we, it, would, it would be like, I think, Tom, you'd said this, mm -hmm. one of... If I, if I wanted it, so we have a blank spot of how we get the submissions translated, but let's say we solve that problem. And I see a question that was submitted from a Chinese speaker that I was like, oh, I want to use that question as one of, for my time. And then I would, I would have, we would arrange with one of the Chinese translators to read that question for me. Right. The funny thing there is that uh, the chancellor doesn't speak Chinese. So we would essentially just be wasting time here by doing it. I, Spanish is different, right? Because you can just reply. Yeah. And then we'll, and then sometimes the gesture is very meaningful and that's okay too. All right. <laughs> okay. So what is the takeaway here? What, I mean, Robin, you're gonna do the Google form, right? Yeah. And you can get that all out to us. Great. So let's just try to uh, get as much done as soon as possible because I think time is going to fly. Yeah. Okay. I agree. And then is the okay. idea to then um, reconvene or just reconvene at face? And we sort of feel like we have a little bit of a mock um, template based on what Tom suggested? I think so. Right. Okay. And if we need to get back together, we will. Right. Yeah. yeah. If we don't feel confident. Yeah. Okay. Motion to adjourn the meeting. Thank you very much, everyone. Second. Thank you. Yeah, wait for a second. And uh, all you. in favor, say aye. Good night. Aye. Good night. Aye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. I can't how many of you stayed signed in. <laughs> it's important what you're doing. Thank you. It goes down to the PTA, everything you're doing, even the way you write your bylaws will be going heading on and they'll be looking at it. Great. So Thank it's very you. important. Thank you. Great work. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.
Bye.